Hey, Barry. Let's cut off another meeting. <clears throat> How's your week? Oh, it was okay. Nothing, nothing terribly exciting to report, but nothing terrible either. Are you a basketball fan? Basketball? No. I'm hardly a sports fan at all. Hi, Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Stacy has to turn on her mic first. There you go. There I am. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Oh, here comes Joshua. Yep. With a shot of the ceiling <laughs> or something. No, that's his uh, thumbnail. How's your week, Stace? I have a scratchy throat today. I feel I feel feel kind of sick. Scratchy throat? Yes. Oh dear. I, I started off thinking it was allergies. I was sneezing a lot. Yeah. Um I don't have, know. You done a, have you done a, a COVID test? No, because I don't I, I've had COVID before. It doesn't feel like COVID. It feels like feels like a cold. Okay. Feels like a cold. Lay off the sriracha sauce. The sriracha sauce? You know, that really hot sauce. Uh, sriracha. sriracha is, is either the canonical name or the trademark name of it. But I would yeah. think that would make it better. I would think that would like open up the airwaves. What I found is I oftentimes put it in my food and sometimes I put too much in. So when I was making spaghetti, one time I overdid the sriracha sauce. And when I went to bed, like midnight, I started feeling an itch in my throat from the sriracha because I'd overdone it. Ah, okay. All right, so I have something on my mind. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna get it off your mind and onto the table where we can pound on it. <laughs> Is there anybody that needs to check in first? Not real, well, unless Sam wants to. Or Joshua. It just feels like the weeks fly by. They do. They really have. I'm back in my uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, California rhythm. So Thursday nights, I don't get in 1 30 or so, 1 o'clock or 1 30 in the morning. So Fridays are a blur. And then I get to think about what we want to talk about for the weekend. And I usually have had very little time to prepare. Hey, Sam, how it goes? I don't remember if we even disposed of the item that you had on the agenda two weeks ago. Do you recall what that was? <laughs> Uh, well, if I stopped to think about it, I might recollect it. But I think there's some dangling participles left in there. I think what I mentioned was, and I have been thinking about it, this idea of a kind of a license. We talked about this last week, that people and other data providers could adopt to say, hey, you can only use my information this way, but not that way, based oh. on the GPL. I remember bringing that topic up. And I think that's yeah. been going on for two weeks. Yeah. But, uh, I think uh, we talked about it enough last week that I don't think we need to do it this week. That's fine. So then Stacy, oh, unless somebody wants to check Sam. in, Stacy has an agenda item. Sam, you want to check in? I'm good. Just really busy this week. <laughs> Insanely busy, business-wise, orders, trouble, fire, putting out fires. And on top of all that, because I upgraded the firewall to the next version, it found so many more trouble <laughs> that I got more junk to clean up. So one of those things that I, yeah, I got more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> You could hire a guy to do that for you, Sam. I tell you, it's 
it's like it's crazy. You found out that you have some old server, you got some old, you know, security hole that was not discovered before, and you found out one of the workstation actually it was has a web server, you know, IIS installed on it, and it's, you know, all that stuff. So like, okay. okay, good, thank you. I'm so glad that this now now I know that you know all that. It's like, sort of like you have a leaking faucet and you didn't know about it, and now you know about it. It's like, well, we can look at it two ways. Like, if you don't know about it, you can just go on until the house collapse, or you can know about it. Now, you can, at least you can fix it. The house will not collapse. So, I'm looking at like, yeah, I'm so glad that I found it that the house will not collapse. But it's like a 20 other leaking I need to fix now. So, Sam C. If Sam Han is saying that you could hire somebody to do it, what's holding you back from hiring somebody instead of doing it yourself and having the added stress? That's such an excellent question. I've been struggling <laughs> for the last 40 years as a business owner. So when you hire someone as a consultant, a handyman, they fix one hole and they take your money and they leave. Now, if they, there are two possibilities. I'm just going to keep it simple here. One possibility, they fix a very good job, they're very responsible and nothing happened. And the other possibility is that they didn't fix a good job, it's terrible, nothing happened. Now you gotta do it yourself. Now, the next question is that, will you hire them again? Or, you know, the thing is, a lot of the workers right now is all because they try to cut the cost. So they basically hire someone that they don't have a choice, but they do this job. They thought, well, I have to do this job to get a paycheck, to kind of edit you. So they do a, I, I don't know what to call that. They do a job that they think, well, it will pass the owners that send me, a, give me the check. So I'm, I'm good for that. So it's like, okay, I'll do it as little as possible, but good enough so that I can get my check, that kind of attitude. And now the problem with that is that if I got 10 holes I need to fix, you know, what, what chances will I take? So I'd rather, that's why I learned how to do it. That's why I, I tell people that in, in today's world, as a small business owner, about less than 20 employees, if you don't know how to do things yourself, you're in big, big, big trouble. You're in big, big, big trouble. Because the worker will, you know, I don't want to call it, threaten you, ransom you, hijack you. Every employee is a key employee. It's sad, but that's the reality. You know, that's why a lot of small businesses are going bankrupt because the consultant is making more money. The credit card company is making more money. The landlord is making more money. The people the loan you the money, loan you money, you know, whatever the business loan you take out is making more money than you. So like, what's left for you? So that's so I insist on doing things myself slowly and gently because I know what to do, and I got empowered by that. I know I do it because it's my thing, and that's the reason why it takes me. You may not believe it, Tracy. Tracy. It takes me a year and a half to convince my wife 30 years ago that, honey, our business is growing too big. I need a controller in my office and trust. I don't have the second doubt about embezzlement and things like that. It's like, I, she was making a lot of money. She was making a lot of money. And I said, well, one or the other, you know. <laughs> she She's the controller. She's the controller financial controller so she see the money in and out see it's sort of like who's the best person to take care of your baby your mother-in-law right right or your next day neighbor that you pay hourly for babysitting <laughs> so i hear i just hear like a really interesting contradiction between how it appears you approach your spiritual life and your business life the way that I think about it this way, I'm going to give you one sentence conclusion will be, I design my business in the paranoid way so that I don't have to live my life in the paranoid mode. If that makes sense to you. Oh, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> it makes too much sense to me. Um, oh. I'm trying to break away from that. I think I lived, you know, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I get it. Yeah, so it's like the same thing as a car, right? I buy the safest car I can money can buy so that I'll be the last person that gets hurt in the accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it but is it possible to find a person that you trust to do the job instead of assuming that of course you, I you do. Said, I got you said that's the reality of it. You said that's the reality of it. You know, you went through how 
every one of them is not trustworthy. And then you said, and that's the reality. It's not. I don't want to put it, everyone is not trustworthy. It's just that they have their agenda, they have their survival mode, they have their bandwidth limitation. Because of that, therefore, this is the result I will be getting. I'm not blaming them at all. I'm just respecting their reality. You know, it's like when you see your doctor, they only see you for five minutes. You know, I, I see my doctor for 45 minutes. You know, every time I have my annual checkup, because I, this is the type of person I am. I want to be complete. I want to be clear. I want to be 100%. You know, let's kind of thing. So, so if I teach a class, unless my students getting 100%, they are not leaving the class. Okay, that that's the attitude I have. So from that perspective, I do have multiples. Like for my IT consultant, my controller. You know, I got about. About 80% of my employees are key employees that yeah, I can trustworthy for. My longest employees with me for 30 years, all the, everyone are trustworthy. I and mean, they care more about business than I do, you know, that kind of thing. So that's the way the team I built for all these years. But I'm saying the last 20% of them is sort of like, like leaking faucet, leaking there. It doesn't happen a lot. It those are the exception. I found a security hole that it was not there before. And now it's, I need to fix it, that kind of thing. So I do I hire a consultant because I'm I'm not capable. My remember a problem is defined as I don't have the resources and wisdom to do it yet. <laughs> so I need to go through the yet part. Yeah. Can you hire somebody to work with you? I like, try I that. Mean, a lot of people. I tell, I tell a funny story. So I, I have a consultant that I will hire. I I you know I have my resources all the world right. So I hire the best company, the most qualified hire the most competent consultant to come in and help me. He, they charged me, this is like 15 years ago, $250 an hour. And they have a minimum and they must hire them for 10 hours. Otherwise they won't do anything for you, right? You know, at the end of the day, after a year and a half later, I spent like probably in the neighborhood $10,000 with them. They don't know DD squad. <laughs> it's hard. I had to, I can go on and on and tell you this in the IT world. It's no different than chat GDP. They know about 90%, they know enough to be dangerous. And you they think that they you think that they know everything because they try to protect you. They have a corporate policy, they won't tell you this, they won't tell you that, and they do it for you. So that it's fixed. You're not allowed to see the wall. I've seal up the wall, you cannot see anything after I fix the flicking for them. And uh, you know, you're not allowed to make a hole in the wall because it's your wall. So if you fix it, make a hole, then you you see the leaking is still not completely fixed or they have a shabby job. You're not allowed to see them. So company policy prevent you from seeing the secret. Uh, they're incompetent. The problem didn't go away. So it's like, okay, fine. Learn I'm my curious lesson. to know, I'm curious to know what Sam Han thinks because I don't know anything about technology. So I'm just, I'm wondering if he has a little bit of a different take. Yeah, I mean, vetting somebody you're going to hire or vetting somebody you're going to uh, contract with is a big deal because <laughs> Sam, Sam's right. You know, it'd be $10,000, it could be two hundred fifty thousand dollars You know, you still have to go through that same vetting process. So working with people you really know well is the really the only way you get around this stuff. And it takes time to do that. And there's always that very first job. Because you have to say, okay, is that being done well or not? And do I want to give this guy another chance? So Sam has all, would... all the right concerns. So I just know that uh, for certain specific problems, however, like, you know, certain specific threats, you could just say, okay, I'm going to solve this one right now. And then just, you know, do it that way. And then see if that person is, you know, good enough to hire for the next problem. But uh yeah, it has to be done in a well-considered way. Not only that, if you're going to have this person uh, solve the problem, you really don't want to spend time overseeing that person. So the time that you spend to oversee someone else's work is also cost. And it can be a high cost. Just to determine whether that person is doing a good enough job, or not, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to delegate that supervision to someone else, that's, again, a cost. And then you have two quality issues you have to deal with, the contractor as well as, you know, whoever you trust to oversee the contractor. But that's that's organizational life. So there's a few tricks I can tell you what I do. Okay, so when I, 
find a worker that's ethical and 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 hardworking and treat your house like their own house. Kind of, I keep them for the years. I was with the same bank, like for example, Bank of America, right? No, no bankruptcy at all. I've been with the bank then for about forty years, so I I don't go anywhere. And my plumber, once I discover him, he's a he's a good man. He's my plumber for life. I don't go anywhere else. I don't care. I pay him ex every time I, I come to me. I pay him extra to make sure he's he kept the job. <laughs> so again, there are a lot of things that it just the best thing I can say is that everybody have limited bandwidth and they got to do whatever they do. And for them to review that they don't know what they don't know, you won't hire them. So they are not open for that the kind of discussion. They will tell you that they know what to do. It's like chat GDP. Otherwise, if it, it chat GDP admit that I don't know this, I don't know this, people get fed up with them and they stop using them, chat GDP, right? But they say, they say, okay, I don't know the 10%. Well, I'm going to make something up for it. And then says that, you know, hopefully you don't know about that. Hopefully it doesn't hurt you. And go on to the next one. Like that. everything looks good. I call it Photoshop. Consulting, Photoshop, work, Photoshop, whatever, it looks pretty. And it's very complicated. It's multiple layers of complexity, multiple layers of responsibility, multiple layers of knowledge <laughs> and, and compensation and conflict of interest. Then this is this is this is another big topic. I call it conflict disinterest. If I hire someone. Think of it like a doctor, right? This is this is 40 years ago. I decide which doctor I go to. If I go to a doctor, that the more they see me, the more they get paid. Versus the same they get paid, no matter how many times I see them, which one do you think I go to? The latter. You know, so Kaiser permanently is the one that I pay you the same amount, you know, of insurance money. I don't care if I receive you 10 times or 100 times or if we see you only one time. That's why, but it was five choices given to me. Like, oh, the golden version, the platinum version, all that. I don't care. I just like Kaiser because they charge me the same amount if I don't see them at all, and or I see them fifty times a year. So again, it's a structure create that behavior. So it's like conflicts of disinterest. If I have a conflict of interest, the more I see you, doctor, the more I pay you. What the hell? <laughs> I'll be dead by then paying you. That's another layer of responsibility, dealing with workers. It's very complex. I mean, I love, I can talk all day about this subject because I pay attention to the tiniest details. Just like a plumber coming to your house and do they clean up the workplace after they left or they had leave a mess, that kind of details. You know, it's really important because if they clean it up, that means they are responsible. They treat your house like their own house. That's mm -hmm. that simple as that. And you can just, because of one simple behavior result, you can see that they're going to do a good job or not on the plumbing. So they deserve if, extra if they're conscientious. Yeah, that's all it is. So again, does it uh, have the, do I live my life? Do I have, run my business? I run my, my business. If you read the book from Andy Grove, like the, the word paranoia, the paranoia. Anyway, the way I tell people is that I design my business in a paranoid way so that I don't have to live my life running my business that way. It's complicated. It's really complicated. I'm so glad you are interested in that subject because I can talk. I get my blood pressure goes up when I sit up on this <laughs> And I love it. I, I'm, after 40 years in business, I'm still loving every minute of it. I, I think it's a great thing. This is why I call it my lab, like 20 employees lab. I study psychology. I study social structure. I study anthropology. I study human interests. I study spiritual. I study every subject in here. And I got the first hand experience all that. It's no different than very, the, look at the students, like, you know, what... What what college I work for and what structure do they have to create the behavior of the student that that I want to my, put myself into the situation or do I get the hell out of there? And yeah, sorry. The main last thing, the main thing about thing is that just remember, their marketing, what they tell you they can do and what they actually deliver are two different. Systems. Two different expectations. So just watch out for that. 
And that's why I only hire people that get referral because they have already had multiple experience with them and they have other, you know, what I call, you know, they, they have they have an important interest to make sure there are other people that are working for them. Also make sure they like them as well. If I, they did something bad to me, then they know the bad news will travel fast and the domino effect will, will get them. So again, you see how the power struggle and power structure and power, whatever you want to call that in there. Okay, go ahead, Sam. I wanted to just uh, highlight one point you made about the plumber and cleaning up is, uh, I forget where the saying comes from. Maybe uh, you were the one to pass it, but other people have sort of said it as well. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. That's right. That's what I say all the time. And with the example, I want to give you one. I got it verified and certified. I'll tell you why. About 20 years ago, I was in the, you know, they call it a median airs club, chow swap, you know, big table and a fancy restaurant. We all get together, all the investors get in, see the table, and everybody get to introduce themselves. And there's one very old man, like an 85 years old man with his wife right next to each other. He told himself that like, I'm the consultant of helping executive making their decisions. I say, great. I was looking for a man like this that do this for a living. <laughs> so he said to me, okay, young man, what do you want to know? <laughs> I say, well, if I can ask you one small question, that'll be satisfying. My, they'll make my day and make my year. I say to him, I ask him, the way that you pick up your shit this morning or this evening is the same way that you pick your wife. <laughs> he paused for a good two minutes. I swear to God, like, Paul for two, like, he went through all the scenario and everything. He's like, I also be tactful about the wife sitting right next to him. <clears throat> you see, yes, you're right, young man. That is true. The logic that he runs through to pick his wife and the logic that he runs through to pick his shirt that he's wearing tonight is the same logic. So with that, I was so convicted. I tell everybody in my class, in my mastermind, I don't care who that is. I say, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything else. I got that certified, my friend. <laughs> Barry, do you have something on your mind? Yeah, um, but I, I have a question of, of Sam C. Do you feel candidly that you're getting your money's worth out of the $20 a month that you're paying for me to have access to GPT-4? I Way beyond that, Barry. I love you. I tell you. $20 is nothing to me. It's, it's not like nothing, nothing. I still have to work hard to get my money. But in the sense that the return I got from you, seeing what you've done with it, I told you right from the beginning, the first five minutes, whatever you did already, already give my money back. Seriously, because it is so such a privilege to know you, Barry. I'm not kidding you. I really respect you. I really, you know, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. You are so meticulous. You are so paying so much attention to all the small details. And this is how you, this is how you live your life. This is the contribution you did to the world is immeasurable. I mean, look, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, the thing that puzzles me that you were willing to bet $100 with somebody about something, but then you're not willing to spend the $20. I don't know. I don't know. I don't see how the logic runs, but I say, well, hell with it. I don't care. It's not important to me. The important thing is that you need a tool. It's sort of like, how do I say this? If you are a fireman and you need a helicopter to put on the fire, I don't care. I'll get you a helicopter. It's fine. You know, that whatever it takes to get you what you need. For me, it's about People think empowerment is encourage people. For me, it's about give you the capability, give you the strategy, give you the wisdom, give you the confidence, give you whatever is necessary. So I call it energize you so they go to the next level. That, but believe me, I've got my money back 10,000 times. Thank you for asking. I'm glad that you're getting your money's worth. Oh, no question about it whatsoever. And I appreciate your 
clarifying and con confirming that. I appreciate that very much. And don't even worry about it. Okay, don't even think about it. I know you do. I can't stop you from thinking about it, but definitely. One of the reasons that occurred to me to ask the question, there are three other things that I do during the week other than what we're doing here, three or four things. One of them is there's a local club called Toastmasters. Meets meets every, what does it meet day? Every Thursday for an hour. And uh, after, co during COVID, they had to go to Zoom for the meetings because they didn't have, they closed the community center where they had been meeting in person. And then last summer, uh, they wanted to start going back to meeting in person, but they realized that COVID wasn't really over, although the community center had reopened and you had to wear masks or whatever. So they tried to have, they wanted to have hybrid meetings. And nobody else was yet ready to try out hybrid meetings because it's a complicated deal. But the president was anxious to try hybrid meetings, even if only two or three people came in person and everybody else was still on Zoom. So we started hybrid meetings and, and what it meant is that anybody in the room who wanted to speak had to get up from their chair, go around and sit in front of the organizers, the president's computer, so they could be seen and heard. And they would go back and sit down. And that was true even if they brought their own laptop, which some of them did because you can't have two laptops in the same room connected to the same meeting with microphones and speakers going on both machines. You, you can, can actually you have to mute one of the microphone, that's all. Well, you also have, you don't have to be wearing headphones or mute the speaker. You don't really need to, if you mute one, as, as long as you allow one microphone in the entire room, we can have 10 laptops in the same room. That's no problem at all. You have to mute all the speakers on the laptops except one, the one that has the live mic. That's right. That's because it. what happens is, is that the sound comes out the other guy's speaker across the room, and then that gives you feedback. Yeah. Right. So, which is complicated because people don't He's get that. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Is that somebody we know? Yeah. I don't know. That's why I, that's why I was waiting right. to get them in. Uh, we'll see who that turns out to be. Oh. <laughs> that's, thought... the duck, that's the duck master. <laughs> The duck master. Okay, so get some coffee. So anyhow, um, the the deal was is that uh, setting up a hybrid meeting, where you want people to be able to have their own laptop in the room, but in the configuration where it doesn't cause feedback. Right. And when they talk, they don't have to get up and go to the other computer. You can spotlight them, which right. is technically possible, but arcane. And the other thing is that um, it's also nice to have a room camera that's just a wide angle room camera for the whole room. Because people who are in the room can see everybody else in the room, but the people at home you know, really, you know, really can't, can't see them. So what I did, and the other thing is, is that you, you want to be able to pick up people who are speaking who are not in front of the one mic. So we got a conference micro, we got a conference speakerphone, right. which we borrowed from a guy from a, an old technology speakerphone, which I had a which I had to adapt to work with Zoom because it was never designed to work with Zoom. So first I adapted a, a, a borrowed speakerphone. Then I began to bring in a, a little webcam, one of those kind that you clip on the top, and I brought in a second computer so I could get a, a room view. Right. And that made it much more possible for people at home to, to sort of participate. And the total cost of all of this technology, this kludgy portable TV studio in a satchel, the total cost that I had to get reimbursed for was $12. Good job. Now, another club at the community center who wanted to do the same thing had to buy equipment and they spent $750 to buy equipment to do the same thing I was doing for junk gear and 12. That's right. Then, um, now the problem with the little webcam is that it's a real wide angle. Right. So then I, I, I remembered that the club had owned a conventional camcorder on a tripod. So 
from like 15 years ago. And I didn't know who had custody of it, but I said, can we get a hold of the old camcorder and discover if it can be used as the room camera for Zoom? Took two or three months to locate it and get it back. And then I found that, well, it had a, an HDMI video output, but it wasn't a webcam. It didn't, have a, it didn't have a USB output. So then I researched it and I found that for $8, I could buy a, a, a little dongle that would convert an HDMI from the camera to USB and make it use as, usable as a webcam. So I set that up. That cost us, that, that's, that's what cost us $8. Okay. And then I became the cameraman and the operator who was doing the spotlighting so that people could just sit in there position in the room and see whoever's talking, hear everybody who's talking, and the total cost to the club was like less than $50 for everything. However, I'm not a member of Toastmasters. I was not interested in the curriculum for learning to be a public speaker. Right. The only thing that I thought would be good for me is to practice my listening skills, which suck. <laughs> <laughs> so I would sit there for an hour and listen to people give these really boring practice speeches. Right. And I would at least have some opportunity to see if I could learn to be a better listener, which I am frankly not. And so they kept me in as, as a guest, not a, not a dues paying member. Mm. Cause I was providing all the service, which pro this professional service is worth well, a, a professional who is doing this is worth at least $120 an hour. That's right. Plus the cost of whatever technology, hardware. Yeah. But I was doing it for zero cost, except right. that I got reimbursed for what I had to buy, which is nothing. Right. And now we've gone through three presidents of the club since this cycle began. And the newest person who is on tap to become the next president thinks it's unfair that I'm not paying dues. I see. Now, I don't know if she realizes that I'm contributing professional services at no cost that's worth about $250 a meeting. Right. If I were being paid to do that. That's right. And, and I said, look, I said, if you think it's unfair that I'm not a dues paying member, um, I would be happy to withdraw from participation and attendance. Yeah. Now she knows what that means. It means that all this work I'm doing to provide the technology for hybrid meetings is going to go up in smoke. Yep. But how to deal with the fact that she see that fundamentally she thinks it's unfair that I'm not a dues paying member of TMI, even though I'm not participating in the public speaking curriculum. And that's why I wanted to ask you that question. <laughs> is it worth you? Is it worth $20 a month? <laughs> So that yeah, I can have GPT-4 instead of GPT-3.5. Go ahead, Sam. <clears throat> Feel free to answer that question because I was actually going to ask a related but different question. Okay, so let me let me jump on here. The three things. Number one, I got tons of webcams sitting in my office that I'd be glad to ship it to you for free and pay for postage. Yeah, I don't believe it. I got some kick-ass, really good webcam in my office that's collecting dust. Just to give you some nice perspective, I saw uh, over a million dollars worth of webcam over the COVID. Yeah, the Logitech, high quality webcam. Yeah, so that's, I'm a webcam king. Let me put it this way for that matter. So that I got lots of webcam sitting in my office collecting that. I would be happy to take off your hands any technology which is gathering dust and you're taking up space, which could be put back into useful service right. for anybody in a club or whatever. Right. And you just need to know exactly what you need it for. And there will be lots of ask. Just ask and you shall get. Okay, that's one. Point number two. Uh, what are you going to say? The solution to the multiple room is actually just thought about it as I listened to you. It's said like making everybody have a headset they're wearing in their head. They block the sound and all that stuff. And then you don't have a, then everybody can speak to it and everybody have their own Zoom session, everybody and all that stuff. And then have an extra one that pointing at a room and that's it, it solves the problem. You can walk away with this with a problem. The third point, if I may, okay, if I may, your problem is not about listening skill. 
The problem is perspective. Meaning? So if you are talking to a three-year-old, you need to have a three-year-old perspective to understand them. And that's the thing that you lack of, if I may say that, listening to you multiple times because you are a college professor and you maintain that perspective and you sit on the perspective like your life depends on it. That You need to give up that. It's like, okay, how would I be a three-year-old young child, playful, no rule, blah, 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 they make second no sense. And I see you laughing at that. You know, if I can accept that perspective, then your listening skill will go up a thousand percent, if I may. Yeah. We can talk about more about it, but this perspective is, you know, this is from especially last weekend's <laughs> argument with, with Sam Ducky, man, right? So that's the perspective. So have fun with it, have flow with it. I put a post a video on on you on Facebook about happiness. You know, it's about flow, it's about playfulness. And then if we can have the attitude, the listening skill go way up. No judgment about anything. As soon as I have a judgment about somebody, I'm blocking you, your concept coming into my body. By the way, not everybody does bring a laptop. Some do and some don't. And we had a person who had been remote up until this week. This week, he showed up in person for the first time, and he gave a Toastmasters speech. He was the main speaker in person. And I didn't know that he was going to be the speaker, and I didn't know that he was going to not bring a laptop. But he says, he says, I want to stand up and off to the side of the room, so I'm away from the tables. And he ended up standing up off to the back of the room to give his speech. So I got up. With the with the uh, camcorder that's on the tripod, and I turned it around and zoomed in on him, and basically was his cameraman for the duration of his twelve minute speech. I had no idea he was going to do that. Right, but he you could not what? have been he could not have been wearing a headphone because he wasn't even tethered. <laughs> this is it. What is that? I can't tell what that is. An iPhone. What's an iPhone? Okay, uh, uh, Android phone with a stand. Yeah, yeah. So let me say this to you one more time. Let's say you got 10 computers, 10 notebook, 10 telephone, whatever it is. As long as every one of them have a headset except one. One person is allowed to have the speaker phone on without headset, they are fine. So if you do that, he can sit in his chair and using his phone, I'm sure he brought a phone, sit on something that he can look at his face and he can speak, give a speech, whatever it is, works best. Yeah, but it, but it turned out that he didn't bring a laptop and he... Decided but he has a phone. Standing. He has a phone. All he has he to has, do is uh, yeah. He, all he has to do is download the Zoom app, <laughs> yeah, yeah. fire it up on this phone, There's something to send on. That's it. Then, then another person who really wants to be on the tech team, who really wants to do what I'm doing, but he's frankly incompetent. Yeah. He had he happened to own a, a a really a really nice Logitech webcam and a tripod, and a second modern laptop computer, which he brought in. Nine. So he sets up the second laptop, sets up the camera and the tripod and starts to zoom and he gets it to where it's not feeding back. And then he does something that you can try here. Um, you know, in, in the main zoom window, uh, there's an option to minimize a win in, in any operating system, you can minimize a window. If on Macintosh, it's the yellow uh, button on, on Macintosh, it's the little horizontal line. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever done that on Zoom? Yeah, minimize Zoom. Yeah, what happens if you hit the uh, the uh, the minimize button? It, the Zoom minimize, goes- in. Minimize the Zoom window. Right, I did. And it goes up into the corner and you just get to see one square instead of all, like right. gallery. You, you get a floating thumbnail of yeah. the speaker, correct? Correct. Yep. Well, I didn't even know that function existed because I had never had an occasion to even want to minimize. So I didn't know it existed. Poor Fred, somehow, without knowing what he was doing, he hit that minimize button. And he had a tiny little floating picture of the speaker and his webcam on the tripod, he couldn't see what it was doing. He didn't know if it was on or off or what it was pointed at. And this is already after the meeting had started. And he's completely befuddled. 
and he's trying to find the weapon. He's waving his hand in front of it. He's looking on the screen to see it. He's <laughs> Finally, after the meeting was over and I pondered what the hell was going on, I realized, I bet he was in picture in picture mode or something like that. And I researched it. I said, oh, I didn't know Zoom had that function. Zoom had got, you know, Fred had gotten in this function that he had no idea that it was in or how to deal with it. And in the middle of the meeting, he wants me to come over and fix it. This is the problem I'm up against. I can't delegate this role to anybody except one or two people who are at the same level as I am in terms of technical competence because they don't know what they're doing. And I got to go, not just supervise their learning, I got to do their job for them and solve their problems for them because they're in some crazy mode that I don't even know about. And, and, and I don't know what to do with this guy. I can't educate him. He's, he's, he's about a, oh, as old as I am. He's in his late test, easily in his 70s. And he has no technical acumen. He can afford to buy the most expensive stuff. He's got late model computers and late model webcam. He said, the, the webcam that he had, he says, by the way, this webcam doesn't have a Zoom. I said, Logitech provides a downloadable application to give you electronic Zoom. So he, I tell him, you know, go to this web page and download it and learn, and learn how to use it. He comes in, he sets it up, he gets in this crazy mode, and I have no clue where the hell he's doing. And neither okay. does he. The perspective is this, if I can give you a perspective. Think of it like you're telling the colorblind person to pick the red color out of the blue. Yeah, right, exactly. It this is exactly happen. what happened. Their yeah. bandwidth is so limited right. and they have no capability to go beyond that. So this is what I do for people after all this 40 years of tech support over the phone, the somebody that's in the blind or what I call colorblind, right? So to say, the thing that I'm going to set up for you, so you know how I remote going to set up everything for them, everything for them that they're not capable of doing, I'm set up for them. I only need you to do one thing. Anytime there's not something that's not working, Shut down, restart, and just follow the step I give you that I train you so many times. Like click on this, click on that, click on this. That's it. Because when you go through shutdown, you all everything gets to ground zero. And then the turn on, you find the icon or whatever, the, or you can have an auto start on Zoom on whatever it is. All the process, the more automation you can do for them, you do them a favor because otherwise they're going to consume all the bandwidth and consume all your patience. <laughs> Basically, I have to tell this guy, I know you have a lot of enthusiasm of being on the tech team, but, and I don't know how to say this, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how to diplomatically tell him, forget it, Fred, this is beyond your ken. And, and there's no, no, mo no matter how much coaching I give you, you're never going to get the mental model to do the, have the knowledge huh. that you need to know to do what you're doing. Yeah. So it's not a lot. I learned how to do, try to do, juggling right i can never go past one yeah exactly so 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 the, the whole thing is it's very strange because here's toastmasters where i could care less about learning the art of oratorical public speaking yeah and i don't even really care that much to hone up my listening skills that's not a big deal either and they can't have hybrid meetings unless i'm there with all this technology and and you know TV studio stuff. And there's nobody else in the club yet who can, if I walk away, they can't, like last week, I wasn't there. And I heard the feedback. It was a little bit problematic. <laughs> they were sort of back to kindergarten again with, you know, with the hybrid meeting. Uh, and I remember when I was at Bell Labs, and one time I got a, a performance review from my super, a new supervisor who was had a PhD in physics. And he said to me, he says, I really don't know what you do. All I know is that when you're around, everything's working fine. <laughs> when you're not around, nothing's working. He says, I never see you actually doing anything. So, well, yeah, I make sure that things are working, but I'm, 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 I'm not gonna bother by telling you, you know, every time I fix something, it's just what I do. But he noticed yeah. that when I was around, everything was working smoothly. And when I wasn't around, things were going to hell in a handbasket. That's good. 
If I were to give them that feedback, I would say to them, I'm so grateful that you noticed that. That makes you a really great leader. He was. I loved I loved working for him because he appreciated me for what I did, even though I didn't have to go in his office and tell him every day what yeah. I did. But did you tell him that? Oh, he knew it. Yeah, see, knowing and telling him are two different subjects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have other people who have no clue the value that I bring to something, and they think, but you're not paying your dues. You can't be yeah, here. Not that's right. They actually kicked me out of the, they actually kicked me out of the club. Yeah. Because I said I I'm not signing on to Toastmasters International curriculum because you have to sign a pledge. Yeah. Which was written for wayward adolescents in the 1920s. I said I'm not going to sign that pledge. There's basically a lot of reason why they have to have you sign a pledge. You think of it like a protection, a safe and trustworthy environment that try to you know, yeah, put you in there. So unless you sign a place, you are not committed yeah. to follow the rules and right. All and the so they so so in the interim, one of the membership chair the, who just took over says, "You can't belong to the club unless you sign on to the TMI, yeah. the international yeah. program." And I said, "I'm not signing on to that. I don't. I don't believe in it." I'm here as a technician to make sure your microphone is making promises. <laughs> then he says, "Then you can't be in the club." So then I left the club yeah. and then the next regime came in and they said, we want you to come back as a permanent guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now the new, the new leadership says, we don't think we think you should be paying the dues like everybody else. <laughs> We're going to go through the same song and dance. <laughs> I said, no, look, look, I said, you don't, you know, you don't want me to be here. I'm fine. I'll walk away. Can you, you imagine want- that you hire the, Toastmaster Club as a business to run your business or help you in your fixing your problem. You see how much chaotic is inside a company organization already? I'll tell you something. I, I counted up. Ten of the members of the local club have independently called upon me to solve a technical problem or some other problem for them. Yeah. Either within the scope of the club or tangentially or even beyond. Yeah. So I have done, and I never asked for money. Yeah. People say, can you come over and fix this for me or figure out what's wrong with my computer? Ten people in the club over the period of five years have asked me for services, which if they had to pay for it, would have cost them hundreds of dollars. That's right. What you just said remind me of when I was working for AMD. VP, VP, which is like six, five level above my head, right? Five level above me. Come walk over. I was talking next to my manager. He put his hand over my shoulders. I had a buddy. I was making buddy because why it's the same thing. The VP need my technical services. Yeah, right. So I'm anyway. happy to, to give, I mean, I, I volunteer for one day, one, one morning a week in the fix it shop. Yeah. I don't get paid for that. I even have to pay for my own gasoline to drive over and back. <laughs> and I even go to people's houses, which you're not supposed to do to fix things that they can't bring in. Yeah. And that's against the rules, but I do it anyway. Yeah, uh, you know, and so the thing is, is that I I'm not in this for the money. Yeah, and it sort of annoys me when people say, "Well, you're doing us this great favor, but you also have to pay us your to the dues <laughs> because we're a dues paying club." <laughs> for for you know to to have a curriculum that I don't care about. So anyway, your decision is that. Do you want to learn how to work with them or do you want to do, you know, be curious of why they think that way and they be about their mindset, all that. So there's so many possible, uh, open up, anytime there's a problem, it's an opportunity for you to like, what, what territory do I want to venture into now? Yeah. Anyway, well, Stacey, had, Stacey had a, a agenda item. Go ahead. Well, I want, to, I want to address this first because I hear a parallel to a story I would hear when women would talk about why they didn't have their children do more or their husbands help more, yeah. which was always, they can't do it right. right? Yeah. So let them screw it up. Yeah. Go up. Let them fail. Let yeah. them, let them do it on their own. If they want to do it on their own, let them mess it up. That's not your problem. Unless the world is going to end, unless somebody's <laughs> life is going to be in jeopardy, let them screw up yeah and then if they screw up enough they will step back and say please barry do this for me then they will value you but if they're not valuing you walk away 
Yeah. And, you know, I, when I was working, I occasionally would invite my coworkers over for dinner, the younger coworkers. And, I, and they come over to my house for dinner. And I would say, if you want to help, stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So my agenda was this. <sighs> and it's the other side of everything being within the structure. So let's, I'm trying to think where to start because it really encompasses everything. <laughs> Something that has really become a concern to me. Um, okay, I know where to start. Recently, I heard a new phrase, which was um, the new atheist. And I had never heard that before. So apparently the new atheist, and I would think Sam Han falls into that category, is a group of atheists that believes that rather than ignore the really religious, they should be mocked and criticized and whatnot. And Barry, if you wanna call it up on Wikipedia, just to make sure I have the right, Sam, is that correct or not? I've never heard this term, by the way. Can we just, then let's get it up on the screen just to make sure I'm getting it right. Cause I hadn't heard of it either. Anyway, my, so the point that I'm, and I've spoken with Sam about this a few times, my feeling has always been that I think that there needs to be more engagement with religious people. And I feel even more strongly about that now. And the reason being, in those communities, you have people who are by nature true believers, people who are lazy thinkers, that if you show them, look, this dot connects here, here, and here, they're willing to take it at face value because everybody else around them is so enthusiastic about it and believe it. But also in those same groups, you have people willing to manipulate those people. And because there aren't other people who are more critical thinkers in that group, to show the other side, there, there's there's no there's no there's no growth of thought, and it's like the critical thinkers have refuse either refuse to engage or because they're mocking, they've automatically cut off would be allies, and so recently I came up. Okay, so let's go back to this. So. The term new atheism, let's say, um, it advocates the view that superstition, religion, and irrationalism should not simply be tolerated. Instead, they should be criticized, countered, examined, and challenged by rational argument. Oh, this looks a little bit different. Okay, the, so, this, so this I kind of agree with because I do think superstition I don't think it should be tolerated. And I do think it should be criticized and countered and examined and challenged. Okay, the last time I looked, it had the word mocked in it. So I don't know if that was recently edited or not. Because I did make a point that I had a problem with it. Yeah, well, I don't know. It's possible that they took the word mocked out. Anyway, I'll, I'll take this down unless you want me to leave it up for now. No, you can take it down. I'd rather see everybody's face. But, um. So this is why I'm really concerned. Recently, I came across a man and his name is Jonathan Kahn. And I was hesitant to even share about him because I did not want to promote him. Now it turns out he's a messianic rabbi who is just so, I mean, so I'm a spiritual person. I'm open to a lot of things. That being said, he is presenting things and drawing conclusions that I think are dangerous. And as I look further, I see the connections to him and people that are coming from other realms, like Naomi Wolf, who was, who was known as a feminist. She was on the left. Then she got caught up in COVID conspiracies. 
what I'm trying to say in as little words as possible is I see people coming from many different areas, whether it be pol whatever it is their, their realm was, and they're connecting around conspiracy, spirituality, but it's but they're they're manipulating it. And what I really want to say is because all of these groups are made up of so many different individuals, for me, the only thing to do is look for the people who don't lie. Because that is the only tell that we can find. I mean, because I don't care if you agree with me. If you agree with me, but you're somebody that I know is known to lie, I don't want to deal with you because you're corrupting whatever it is that are, that's around me. And I think we really have to have an emphasis to make lying wrong again, because somehow we've forgotten that lying is a sin. So that, that is my message. So because I always say you need like a different message for each group, I've decided my new message is Exodus 2016. And I will frame my message for every audience, but the title is always going to be Exodus 2016. If I'm talking to a political audience, Exodus 2016, I have a make-believe story for that. If I'm to whoever I'm talking to, Exodus 2016 is my title. I'm complete. Do <laughs> you want to say something, Sam? Just for completeness, would you quote Exodus 2016? No. Look it up. Here, I'll bring it up on Google Bard and um, share. I can get to the right place here. While he's looking up what Exodus 2016 really is, there is another part for Exodus 2016, for me, that relates to the 2016 election and the exodus of certain values. So I'm just gonna let you know that that's like a, sort of like a double entendre. The reason I ask is because there are hundreds of translations of the Bible. Right, well, that, that's why I'm explaining to you, it's not all the biblical reason for using that. That's why I'm asking for the reference. It's about lying. It's about bearing false witness. I don't remember lying. I mean, the way lies have been treated in society definitely changed in 2016. That was the turning point. Lying is such a complex subject, right? <laughs> is it? Of course it is. I'll tell you what makes it. Should I take this down? Have you read it long enough? Up long enough to read it? Exodus twenty sixteen is the night is nine of the ten commandments, which are set of religious and moral principles that play an important role in Judaism and Christianity. The commandment reads, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This commandment prohibits lying about someone else in a way that could harm them. It is important to be honest and truthful in our dealings with others and to avoid spreading rumors or gossip that could damage their reputation. Yep. And to Sam, I just want to say that I'm talking about in the simplest of terms, lying, it's easy to know if you're lying. If I if I say yeah, it, it, it's easy. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, go ahead. So I'm not a biblical scholar. Why is it necessary to have the neighbor reference? Why not just stop at thou shalt not bear false, false witness? Because is that too much of a generalization? It doesn't make any sense. But when you all generalization is a lie, including this one. Right. But I'm 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 asking or I'm leaning into the nuance of it being for a neighbor in other words the neighborhood are we talking about the block are we talking about the region are we talking about the country are we talking about the planet you know the neighbor is that time, someone I you know someone you live planet. right next door to the neighbor is someone you know someone that is you consider as a neighbor exactly that's why i'm saying why limit it to that scope 
because the more limited it is, more the more true will be. You cannot argue with the limited things. Like I'm Sam, you cannot argue with that statement, right? But if I say I'm I'm a Chinese man, so you can argue with it because it's generalization. Give you more room to argue, right? The more limited facts, the narrow it is, the less chance that you can argue with me. Yeah, that sounds plausible. I was just wondering what the Bible was trying to get at. You know, was that the direction in which the Bible or whoever wrote that particular passage was going for? It making it make give you a statement that you cannot argue with me. <laughs> if I could just move away, just I just want to add a part because this is really what's underneath all this. I'm truly concerned. This particular man that I mentioned, he has a series of books that he calls novels, but they're not novels. He's He actually quotes these books that most of us will look at and say they're novels, but he actually talks in his speeches and he says things like, and I'm quoting from the book now. He's quoting a novel as if it's fact. He's talking about things like Tucker Carlson and explaining how Satan has caused this. And this book is the number one bestseller. And the people reading these books are Christian men in Bible groups around the country that wield, that yield a lot of power. This is scary. I mean, I'm genuinely concerned. I hear you, Cece. I know. And because we're siloed, we're not aware of these things. And so I'm really wanting to bring awareness. There's silo everywhere, including country, including borderline, including races, including, you name it. Everywhere. Well, but, but within our country, and, and this is why I've always said that I didn't like the idea of mocking religious people because it turns off people that say, like somebody like me, I'm not a religious person, but if, I'm, if I was in a group of people that were mocking anybody who believed in God, I wouldn't want to deal with them because, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me, well, my concept of God might be different and we haven't defined what that concept is, I do believe in something called God. So I'm not even going to continue in a conversation where people are mocking a belief in something that we can't see or prove. I would much rather be in conversations with people that say, well, if prayer actually does work, how might that work theoretically? How could that possibly be? I would want to be in a room where there's Okay, so how, if what you're saying is true, how might it work theoretically instead of that can't be? Because that, that's what creates the silos, not having room for possibility for different thoughts. Sam still has his hand up. Sam, is your hand up from before, or you have something you want to say? It's from before, but I can also reference this particular topic because you mentioned my name in reference to this topic. Because we've so discussed it a lot. We have, but you seem to group me in with this group that uh, is kind of extreme in this behavior. And I admit that can be possible. I admit that I could come across that way. But it's not after no attempt. I do make attempts to try and talk to people with these very, let's say, God-like or you know, Bible-like uh, beliefs. But after a limit, when it's evident that information and evidence and rational thought and critical thinking doesn't really work with these people, then I stop. So it's not without any effort. It is with some effort. In fact, I've had an open invitation for many, many years to uh, talk to people on the, you know, let's say the political extreme right, shall we say, about their beliefs, about their foundations, about their evidence. I've had only one taker in years agree to have that conversation. That one taker 
quoted everything from Breitbart, Breitbart, the publication. And after the first question about any of them, it's like, oh, well, I don't know. It's just what I read. So I didn't get very far with that evidence, with that person and with that conversation. And very few others have actually stepped forth to have that conversation. So I do, in fact, highlight this as a failure in society. And I know I've, I've mentioned this before, and I, I think you push back strongly about the way I expressed this belief, that if we let idiots have influence in society, and that's a strong loaded word, I understand, then we get an idiotic society. And if we have a lot of people who are not valuing education, truth, rational thought, science, exploratory experimentation, actual reasoning, actual, you know, generous discourse about disagreements. If we have people who don't appreciate these things and only want to believe what they understand, only want to believe what their regional family or, you know, cult slash church slash, you know, group says to believe, then we get people who influence society who do not have an appreciation for truth, who do not have an appreciation for science, do not have an appreciation that they in fact use the benefits of science and engineering to actually espouse these idiotic thoughts. Society will go down in flames if we allow such masses through a democratic process to influence what gets done with our global assets, with our group decision-making. And I know that uses very strong words, but I do strongly hold this position so that in my opinion, humanity survival is not the top concern I have anymore. I don't think humanity is going to survive. What I care more about now is whether the peaks of humanity, the peaks of our knowledge, of our experience, of our scientific discoveries, of our wisdom, of our any field of endeavor, I wonder whether that will survive. And I think that, you know, the point now for me is whether that will survive beyond our species, beyond our current civilization. And I think there are others who view it this way and are looking at how do we preserve this. So in fact, you know, we have Arctic uh, kinds of uh, vaults being created. We have people, you know, sending vaults of information to uh, different planets and sorry, uh, to the moon, for example. And that I think is the way we sort of help following societies, following civilizations, the ones that will come after us whether they're humanoid or whether they're insectoid, try and get a, you know, a jump start on their civilization. But humanity as we know it right now, the way we're doing it, it's not likely to survive over. So you use the word idiots, which seemed to come with the, to me, I heard that as those were the Christian people. And not yet, just, not just. Okay. But my, but the point I want to bring up is, so for example, there's a Christian representative in Texas who used a very intelligent argument, a Christian argument, against why this new bill that they were proposing to put the Ten Commandments posted in schools. He explained in very intellectual Christian words why it was unconstitutional and unchristian. And to me, that's not an idiotic argument. That's an intelligent argument that's going to hold weight with that population. And that is very much needed. And so if you would have just dismissed that, then nobody's making that intelligent argument. And that's a problem. Yeah, I don't know this person, but I would not off the cuff just dismiss it. There, one of the things that confounds the question of truth telling is the, is the difference between a belief 
and an accurate belief. So for example, people believed that the sun went around the earth. And that was based on observation. It happens to be an inaccurate belief. It turns out that the earth rotates on its axis, which gives you the illusion that the sun is going around the earth. And all through human history, right up to modern physics, modern science, you have this things that you see, evidence, and you form a hypothesis, a belief, a model, which may or may not be accurate. And we live with lots of mental models which are usable, but inaccurate. And I can articulate a belief, honestly articulate a belief, say the Copernican theory or the um, uh, Ptolemaic theory. And I can say, here's a theory which I subscribe to. And I honestly believe that it's the correct representation. And here's another model historically that I no longer subscribe to, even though it was usable, it's misleading in some substantive way. So I can have a belief which may or may not be accurate. And I can articulate a belief sincerely, which is simply a mistaken belief. So you have this question is when, is somebody lying if they honestly disclose a belief that happens to be mistaken. That's one perspective well, of lying. Yeah, and so the point is, is that in order to lie, if I understand how you should interpret the word lie, I have a belief which I genuinely adhere to, but when I speak, I deny the thing I believe and I say something else. Yeah. I say something that departs from what I genuinely believe whether or not my belief happens to be an accurate mental model of reality. Yeah. Can you tell the difference between somebody who has an accurate belief and says the opposite, or somebody who's totally deluded and says the opposite of what they delusionally believe? It's really tricky to tell an honest truth teller who has accurate knowledge from somebody who's totally deluded, but says the opposite of what they delusionally believe. There's a whole bunch of logic puzzles that try to distinguish the, between these cases of dissembling about what you believe, whether or not your beliefs are accurate or delusions. Try those logic puzzles. You'll see how tricky they are. Sam, can I just jump in real quick? Because I'll forget my thought. And I, oh, just, want to okay. I, just, I just want to clarify that at least in a personal interaction, the importance of knowing if somebody lies, not so much if you're dealing with them one-on-one, -on -one, but to be aware of who the people that lie are when you're looking for confirmation about something. So it's not the direct liar, but it's to be aware that when, cert, when, <clears throat> when you're looking for confirmation and you're going to get, you know, like you're not sure, let's say it's a hypothetical is being proposed. Be aware of whose opinion you're asking. So like in the case of Tucker Carlson, the fact that it's been proven in his own texts, it's been proven that he knowingly lied, was willing to lie. I've seen his own recordings where he says, I lie if I need to. He says it. I saw it with my own eyes. If you know that somebody is admitting that they will lie when they need to, be aware that is not the person that you want to go to for confirmation. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. I was going to give a, a perspective on this notion of truth and belief. And it's a matter of what you're really trying to do. And I'll give you one example. I used to say, if you want to go cross town, a horse and buggy will do. You know, you can have a little bit of a wobbly uh, wheel. You can have a little bit of weakness in the axis. You can actually axle. You can actually have a faulty steering wheel. You can have weak horses, but it'll get you across town. So the degree of precision you need in the structure of the vehicle you're in, whatever it is, okay, only needs to be sufficient to get you to where you want to go. 
but you can't use a horse and buggy to get to the moon. You have to be much more sex. You have to have fine seams. You have to have the right O-rings. You have to right, have the right propulsion. You know, so the degree of precision you need to go further than cross town is more than what you need to go just a few blocks. Just like, you know, if you want to ride a tricycle, you can only go so far. But if you want to go across the you know, country, you can't do it in a tricycle really. So it does depend on what you want to do with your structure, with your engineering, with your truth, with your belief, okay? And so that's the degree of approximation that you can determine whether or not it's acceptable. So if you're really trying to say, hey, you know, I'm going to plant my crops and, you know, my heuristic is, oh, well, you know, if there was a ring around the moon last night, you know, it's probably going to rain tomorrow. That's fine if I'm just, you know, trying to use that. And that was like, you know, 200 years ago. That's my, that's my truth, quote unquote, for planting crops. But if I'm trying to, you know, plan how we keep a certain desert uh, arid or, uh, sorry, uh, productive for generations, I have to think differently. I have to think about hydroponics. I have to think about engineering. I have to think about, you know, ergs. I have to think about, you know, water volume. I have to think about civilization. I have to think about transportation. I have to think about costs. So the degree of precision you need is determined on how far you want to go. And if you want to have false, loose, matter of fact, you know, uh, beliefs that get you till tomorrow, that's okay. You live your life that way. But if you want to make decisions that impact society, if you want to have decisions that impact the planet, you cannot think in a sloppy way. So I am against sloppy thinking when it comes to scalable decisions that have to impact millions or billions of people. Sloppy thinking is at best wasteful and at worst devastating and debilitating and disastrous. Over. Yeah, I just want to disagree to one on one thing. I don't care why you believe that you should love your neighbor as you should yourself and your God. If you believe that you should love people, I don't care why you believe it. If that's going to inform the way you make policy and decisions, I don't care why you believe it. One does not, just because you believe that because it came from a book does not mean that you can't make good decisions. The I will disagree that with that. Well, that's where we disagree. I'm talking about the lazy thinkers, and there are many, yes, I do think there is a higher concentration of lazy thinkers in the evangelical community. I will say that. They are lazy thinkers, and they're, because there are no critical thinkers there, it just gets skewed. And that's a problem because a lot of these are theoretical conversations and there are no voices saying, well, let's imagine something different. There's no other possibilities. You know why they created Lazy Thinker? How did Lazy Thinker come about? They got brainwashed. They have low bandwidth. They don't have the opportunity to learn. They have no idea what you know, critical thinking is. Let me give you a different perspective really quick. The big structure that I see is that can I trust someone that get paid millions of dollars tell me the truth or that he has a survival problem that his livelihood depend on whatever he need to say to please the audience that he's attracting? Which one has bigger impact on him? A lazy thinker telling lie? Who cares? I mean, they admitted in the court of that's why they settled for 600 and some million dollars because they know they expose the whole <laughs> whatever you want to call that, you know, big lie or whatever you call it. It's the structures, you know, I call it the structures to be, that's all it is, the structure. But you know what, Sam? Yeah. I just got to say something. But I would trust Barry with that. I would trust me with that. Because you don't have a multi-million dollar salary coming your way, $500 million or whatever that, yeah, any salary, if I can well, say everybody, that. Everybody, look, 
there comes a point. Yes, if, if, if my life was on the line, then maybe it's going to be different or maybe it's not. I don't know. I can hope that it's, I mean, I can only hope that I would hold myself. But there are people that hold themselves to a higher standard than others. And it's easy to see who those people are. And we should be supporting those people and we should be creating structures that right. support those people. Well, let me put it this way. So someone that have a good, whatever character structure, they, 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 got, snake, they got into the job. And once they get rewarded with multiple million dollars and the lifestyle get depend on it, then they have to flip. You know why? Because they have now they have a sellout. Why they have a sellout? Because they're committed or they are, they have got hooked into, they got stuck but into people, that state. But people sell out for much less. People sell out to be invited to a birthday party. People sell out to be invited on a boat. People sell out for much less. And it starts It starts much earlier. Agreed. And we need to stop it much earlier. And we need to speak it out. Sam? Two points. Responding to Sam about how come there's such a prevalence of lazy and sloppy thinking and lack of critical thinking. I do think it goes back to the fact that hundreds of years ago, sloppy thinking, lack of smartness will get you killed. You wouldn't survive. The tiger would get you, disease would get you, the neighbor would get you, whatever. Right now, we've made it too easy for lazy thinkers, stupid people to survive. Society props them up, gives them a safety net. So we have now a prevalence of sloppy thinking and people think, I don't need to know math. I don't need to know science. I don't need to know psychology. I don't need to know any of that stuff because I know I'm going to eat tomorrow. That's one response. Second, whether or not one's life depends on the truth of what one says, that was the theory on which the Supreme Court was created and people were appointed for life. They said, oh, if this person is not fearing for their job, chances are they will be just. They will be, you know, interpreting the law according to the principles of the law, not according to the politics of the law. Well, we know that's not true anymore. That's been corrupted, definitely. So, you know, whether or not someone is safe from saying the truth or falsehood or something like that, you would think that's true, but it's actually not true in a very visible way, unfortunately. Let me go Over. back to your point about survival depend on critical thinking. Well, it used to be true, but all the time got get killed and put in the zoo, then everything is safe. They, they can be a lazy thinker without worry about their survival anymore in these days. I call that in the old generation, we in the survival you have to work hard, you have to be this, and you have to do that to survive. But in the old days, this old days, the new days that we are living in the world abundant. You can be a sloppy, you can be lazy, you can be whatever, you still survive. That's my point. Yeah. Because we have a we have a society now, it's an abundant world. But the point know? is, these civilization-threatening uh, factors, like global warming, like uh, air quality, like you know, the lack of uh, you know, sufficient um, forests, See, they still exist. These threats to society still exist. The problem is now, most of society doesn't respect those people who understand these problems and know how to address them. Because now the relative proportion of idiots to smart people is much higher. So idiots vote they control budgets. These budgets go towards entertainment. They go towards fighting wars. They don't go towards science. They don't go towards climate uh, uh, amelioration. They don't go towards what these strategic smart thinkers say we have to be thinking about. And that is a death knell for society. Over. Uh, there's something interesting about this faculty of being an accurate systems thinker. Somebody who can look at the current set of practices in the culture and say, if we continue these practices indefinitely, it's gonna go badly for us. We're gonna start uh, creating an unlivable world or we're gonna you know, end up in conflict. 
There have always been people who are very good, reliable, accurate, visionary thinkers. Today, we call them scientists and systems thinkers, but they've been around since the dawn of recorded history. They're very, very tiny demographic. They had a name for such people back in biblical times. They were known as prophets. Prophets were people who could look to the distant future and anticipate some undesirable outcomes if we didn't change our ways, and they would preach changing our ways. Now today, the same prophets are people like Sam and me and, and other people who are now called scientists, and we're saying we are engaged in practices which are unbecoming. They're gonna to lead to bad outcomes. We don't call ourselves prophets today, we call ourselves analysts, but we're using the same kind of thinking, long range visionary thinking, model-based reasoning where the models are reliable. They make predictions which are gonna come true. The only difference is nomenclature and the fact that we can write down the models and put them in into mathematical uh, languages and computer languages. What this guy, Jonathan Kahn is doing is he's pointing to all the things that have happened. Everything that we see in the news, everything we see with transgender people, everything that's happened with school shootings. He's, he's pointing to all the things that Prophet said, and he's saying, this is what happened and this is what it means. And for example, if I were in the conversation, I'd be able to say, yes, this is what happened, but this is what it means. Like there'd be able to be, to take those same set of facts and just propose some, an alternative to that. And that, and I'm just like, there's no, these are, these are theoretical. So there is no, you know, absolute yes or absolute no. It's just a way to engage the imagination in thought, but using certain practices that are reliable. So what's your outcome that you your desirable outcome? What, what do you want and how do you know when you get it? Survivability and happiness. You know, I'll I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that happened that that makes for me personally made me happy. You know, on your birthday on Facebook, you get all these happy birthday messages. I got at least out of them, you know, I got many. But there were about 10 that meant something to me. And why they mean something? Because they're from people that I know from however long ago that I totally disagree with on politics, that know that I totally disagree with them, where I've gone on their pages and I've questioned them and I've pushed back, and that they still have some connection to me or enough respect for me to wish me a happy birthday. That meant something. Um, but to, to answer your question, I am, in general, one of the issues that I see is that as long as we remain separated from each other, there is no hope for us. And there are no idiots and them. There are no, there, there just aren't. And, you know, that, that's what frustrates me. And I, I, my mission is to try to find people that can help weave together different groups. So step one, it'll be see if you can, okay? Learn how to engage in the conversation that does not frustrate you. I do. The, the I'll tell you the difficulty. I don't like doing it in writing. It takes so much strength to be able to, like it's a lot of effort to be able to communicate in writing when only a small percentage is the written word. So for me to be able to get the tone and everything I wanna be able to get into the writing, it takes a lot of bandwidth that I don't have. You know what I do in the situation that you just mentioned? I'll copy and paste it into ChatGTP 4.0 and say, what should I say? It works really well. So I get the text on ChatGTP and then paste it on Microsoft Word 
and then add it into so they to fit my taste and get my point across. And then I take that from Microsoft Word and paste it back to the Facebook or yeah, what, what, what reason. That's I what I do. It, that doesn't feed my soul. I'm just I, saying, like, it, I it, like talking to people. The way so I understand. Now, so instead of taking me, you know, 10 units of base, my or bandwidth, it only takes a half a point or something along the line. So that's one perspective. The other perspective is I just click on the messenger, direct messenger, and say, is, is, can I tell me talk? I'd love to talk to you about this. So engaging is the best way to do it. I agree totally verbally, but sometimes they don't feel like engaging. So that's I go back to the using a tool to allow me to engage in such a way that it doesn't use up too much of my bandwidth. So again, it's just, there are many ways you can do that. And the other one is just, I put a smiling face. It's like, and the other one, I can put a question mark on the comments. So it's like, okay, help me to understand this because I'm having a judgment about you and I don't like to have a judgment about you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't spend that much time on it anymore, you know, other than just sharing. At this point, I just, want to bring up certain things like I did today because I am I see that whatever you want to call the other side whatever you want to call the forces that are looking to divide because there are yeah. definitely forces that are looking to divide and conquer they're really they're collaborating very well the dark the, those forces are collaborating very very well and so for me the red flags are where women aren't being treated well, you could usually tell that's a problem. And where people are willing to overlook lies, that's a red flag. Look at those two things and you'll get a good sense of, and I'm not saying stay away from the whole group. I'm saying, look for the people within that group that are not totally comfortable and try to connect with those people. Yeah. You know, something very interesting happened today, this morning. I don't know how many people turned on their television early this morning to watch a very important world event. Yep. What? The king. Prince oh, the Charles king. was crowned the king of the of England, the United Kingdom. Yeah, 5 a.m. The monarch. He's the, now, here's the interesting thing. It's a big world. Everybody, I mean, it's one of the most watched ceremonies worldwide on television king charles does not have the power to make the rules anymore he's the king with no power now what's important is not that he's the king what's important is that the authority to make the rules that other people have to follow was taken away from the monarchy not just in england it was taken away from the monarchy in most of the countries except for a few that still have monarchs that really do make the rules. Now, I happen to be even beyond that. I think nobody should have the power to make the rules. I believe that we shouldn't even have rules at all. I believe we should have something more functional, more effective, less chaotic, less conflicted than a rule-based architecture for governing how people behave. I believe we should have systems of ethics. Unfortunately, our species sucks at the calculus of ethics. Unfortunately, we're not mature enough to be ethical uh, practitioners. And this is why I think we're doomed. We're not smart enough to regulate ourselves in a way that's not an unbecoming mechanism for self-regulation. And by the way, I think these AIs may actually have the faculty of ethical calculus. Hadn't, hadn't been shown yet, but I think they I think they have the aptitude to do ethical calculus that 98% of human beings lack. Go ahead, Sam. It's interesting you go there because I raised my hand because of this precise point is because these LLMs, these bots, these GPTs are trained on patterns of text and you actually claim that they have a belief. This goes back to the previous notion about whether or not someone is ethical or lying based on what they believe and what they say. 
Okay. So can you even ascribe belief to a bot? And if so, if the bot is then presenting it to you in a concise form, which is its form of delivering a message to you, but obviously because there's so much disagreement in the corpus of knowledge that it has mined in order to get that message to you, it's gonna disagree with some of what it has ingested. So does a bot actually believe anything? Because today, the way they're trained, I mean, this will change in the future, but the way to, they're trained today, I don't think they have belief. They have patterns that are probabilistically calculated. Is that a belief? Now you could say, hey, that's what a human belief is as well. I have, you know, nine people in my family, seven of them told me this, the other two, you know, haven't really, you know, gotten to age three yet. So I'm going to believe it. That's one way humans use patterns to say, this is what I believe. And this is the historical way. So that is interesting when you talk about ethics and AI and bots. I, 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 what I'm saying applies only to this moment. It will change in five weeks. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> Just want to let you know. That's one question that I would put on the table. Over. But when a weather model says there's a 20% chance of rain in San Francisco tomorrow and a 30% chance of drought in uh, Southern California next week, I would call that a belief. It's a calculation of what's likely to happen to the best of its knowledge. If I Why do we have to use the word belief? You don't have to, but we do. Exactly. Because that's because that's the dictionary word that people recognize. If I say... Um, I have a 95% confidence interval that this is going to happen in this time. Most people, their eyes are going to glaze. They don't know what I said. Right. So they, notice I, what happened, right? I say, the I believe it's going to rain tomorrow. They know what I said. They know so what I said what... and what it means, even though I used a word that is a street word instead of, I have a 95% confidence interval that this event is going to take place, which is the, which is the correct way to say it. But I've lost my audience. This goes back to what Sam says about talking to a three-year-old. If I say that to a three-year-old, there's no idea what I said. If I said, hey, kiddo, I'm pretty sure it's going to rain tomorrow. Kid knows what I said. He doesn't know why I said it, why I have any confidence. He doesn't even know what the word confidence means. So these bots have learned to communicate in the street language that ordinary people can decode, even though that is a great grammar school or middle school language. They don't, they don't, if they talk in, in graduate level language, 95% of the people have no clue what they said. So I say, well, I believe it's gonna to rain tomorrow. But it's, 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 it's not a religious belief, it's a calculation. If I may, two points. Yeah. The language we use has come through the, uh, the fullness of time exactly. in double quotes, right? Yeah. So we use new concepts because we have better understanding of what's going on. Right. Where someone would have said, hey, I'm a prophet because I have this belief or I have this vision. And that would have flown, you know, 300, 400, 500 years ago. Now we say, well, I got this probabilistic model and this, you know, uh, GPU tells me that, you know, 95% or, you know, to a five sigma or seven sigma or whatever, I can make this prediction. The language changes based on what we understand and the technology that we have evolved. Right. And if you're all listening to NPR. So that's why I ask, <laughs> do we use the word belief again? Because that's a centuries old term. Or can we use other terminology that right now is more precise for those in the know? like model, like prediction, like correlation, like, you know, uh, projection, you know, all these terms which have a much more precise notion and have to do with how this statement that you're calling a belief was derived or calculated. That was point number one. Point number two is, I want to go back to a point that Stacy made quite a while ago, 
about, I don't care if anybody, you know, uh, has a basis in love. I just care that they love. I do care why they actually came to that conclusion. Because again, that point that uh, Sam and I were trying to reference earlier, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if this person has this, you know, fantastical, mythical, whatever basis for love, then uh, I can count on them having that driving their other decisions, their other mm-hmm. actions, their other statements. So whether or not you think you just want to pick one uh, motherhood and apple pie thing and say, oh, just love everybody and just make sure that everybody loves. I think that the way they love affects the way they do everything else. The foundations for how they love affect the foundations for how they think about other ideas and other behavior and other characteristics of personality. So that's why I care. If someone is sloppy and just says, oh, I I will love simply because these six people that I care about tell me to love, then to me, it's a very shallow form of understanding what love is. So that's why I care. Okay, so... The, re- the reason I disagree is because what I'm saying is I want to know what is in their nature. Not I want to know what they're doing naturally, not because they think this is what they have to do, because if it's not in their nature, eventually there's going to be some misalignment. <clears throat> Thank you, Stacey. I love what you just say. I need to jump in right now. Okay, so the meaning of every word it's always depend on the context and the content. It's like, I was having so much hard time, like the word no way in America, like no way. It's like, what the hell does it mean? I have no idea. So I had to listen to the content. I to see that. So belief is the same thing. I believe that tomorrow is going to rain versus I believe in God. It's a totally different meaning altogether. You're not listening to the definition of a word. You're left with the meaning of the whole sentence. Like what you say is, a, what is there? you know, believe, what is the uh, content, what is the, what did you just say, Stacey? What is in their nature. What is in their nature. The bigger picture that tells you the actual meaning of the word, of the definitions, because it depends on that. Without that, it has no meaning at all, because we're just taking those words out of, out of context. Salbai has no meaning. I'm complete. You know, I could use very technical terms to say, for example, uh, towards some artifact out there, I have an appetitive drive. And to a different artifact, I have an aversive drive. Now, it, what would a th- three-year-old make of me saying, I have an appetitive drive towards this, but I have an aversive drive towards that? That you have different, sense. something different. They would know it was different. Right. That was it. <laughs> would they know that I love to play with this and I hate to play with this or I don't like that? So if I say I love, it means I lit technically means I have an appetitive drive. That's that's how a neuroscientist would say love. It's an appetitive drive. Now, if you say what's the opposite of love, you're going to get two different commonplace answers. What's the two most commonplace opposites of love? What two words? Fear and hate. Yes. Some people say, I hate this. I don't say, I, I dread that. Now, a theologian will say the opposite of love is dread, fear. But somebody else will say, well, it's hate. I prefer to say, I have an aversive drive. I dread that. So like and dislike. But you see, the point is, is that we have these words, love and hate and fear, which have been in the vocabulary for since the dawn of invented language. Hate and fear sound like they're completely different things, but they're yep. technically synonyms for aversive drive, which is the 21st century neuroscientist terminology. I hate carrots. Okay. <laughs> right. I love a, re- a raw steak. I mean, it's appetitive and aversive. Yeah, so same problem that we, it's, I call it the big word, the good, the bad, the low, the high, the F word, <laughs> all that. So yes, we could say, well, my neural network has appetitive drives and aversive drives, and that's accurate. Right. And I've lost 95% of my audience again. Yeah. 
So the lazy thinker will use the right, the wrong, you know, all that, you know, all that stuff. So good, the bad, I, I love it, I hate it. So when I have a conversation with someone that I like to help or they need my help, I say, okay, tell me more about what you mean by you love this, you hate it. Yeah, because unless I have the difference that make the difference, I have no way to help you. So I, I love this dish. What they love about this dish is because of sugar. Okay, I'll put more sugar. They make you love more. It's like, like that. I mean, these are suitcase words that have such vague meanings, yeah. such unscientific meanings, poetic meanings. We have all these poetic words. We yeah. love these poetic words. But what the hell do they mean? A scientist wouldn't write poetry for a technical paper because right. you know, it doesn't really, it's, it's imprecise. Right. And if you love those kind of words, you want to learn more, get one more vocabulary, learning from the fortune teller, learning from the horoscope. Exactly. They tell you give a lot of those kind of words. I also want to point out, though, how we've been trained to be lazy thinkers and how sometimes it benefits us as an individual when people don't question us and how we individually sometimes use force to like, let's say, with our children, how we don't want them to dig deeper, like sometimes being a careful thinker can get you into trouble. You might get burned at the stake. I have been burned at the stake metaphorically because mm -hmm. because being a careful thinker. Because I reject cultural practices which I think don't have a future. But people in power need those cultural practices because that's what the basis of them having power. Yep. And what we see a lot of now is for a lot of people, it's easier not to know the truth. A lot of times people don't want to know. Let, let's say you're in a let's say you're in a marriage and your spouse is cheating on you. You may not want to know because if you know, then you have to do something about it. Melania I, knows, but she doesn't talk about it. At least not in public. <laughs> she knows. But I'm saying we have to look at all sides of, of a situation. We That's tend not to do that very well. That's why I say expand the picture, the content, the nature, you know, all that, unless you have that. And that's what that's why two, two persons with different culture will have a lot of conflict because they don't have the same content in their vocabulary. And that's why they get into a lot of fight because what they think they mean one thing is mean something else in a different content. And they grew up with that. And their belief system is totally opposite or something like that. And the number one reason of marriage failure is that different content. If, if the friendship would not last very well if they have different culture as well. Unless you ask, I'm not. You know what? Do, what do you mean by that? Or you know, how do you mean that? I you know I don't. I had to do that, Barry. There was somebody on a post that was on your page, and I assume he's a very very smart man with a lot of diplomas or whatever. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and I just said, I, I don't understand what you mean. <laughs> but technical, technical terminology that's academic language. And you didn't take those courses. So you didn't learn that vocabulary. Well, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the case or if maybe he just wasn't making sense. Maybe it's possible he was. He he seemed to just be using phrases. You talk, you're not talking about Esteban. You're talking about somebody else. Yeah, somebody else. I'll I'll have to go back and look, but I didn't really understand. Yeah, I didn't understand. It so didn't, what I it, do, Stacey, if I may, just if, you, if you're interested in this again, copy and paste it to Chat GDP and say explain to it me. It wasn't a question of that. He wasn't using complete sentences. Okay, was, it's fine. You can take the whole chunk and say, this is what Chet did we say, this is what explained to me like this. Is that true or false? So it give you another step of opportunity to learn from him if you want. Again, is use a tool of the Chet DP, I can you and I can agree that it's the smartest one of all. If Chet DP don't even understand, then you're in big trouble, right? Was it H. G. Taylor, maybe? No, I, I know. I know. Oh. All right. I know. Anyway, I mean, I, I may be confusing a few different situations. Uh, you know, I'll talk I, had, I, I get people who who start a comment thread on one of my posts, and they'll start a comment thread, and somebody will chime in, and there'll be two or three people having a conversation, which, to my mind, is total gibberish. <laughs> okay, 
and and it happened just the other day. So I I took the the thread that was started by I think H. G. Taylor and Esteban chimed in and Ol uh, Oliver Siegel chimed in. I think the three of those guys chimed in. I took the that section just. I wasn't a participant. I took that section and I put it into, I think, Bard, you know, Chad GPT or Bard. And it recognized what they were talking about because it recognized the words. It recognized the vocabulary, but it didn't know what they had said. <laughs> and basically it says, well, they're having a very nice discussion about, and it said what they were talking about, but there were no predicates. <laughs> The point is, is that you can mention a lot of things and never put them into a predicate that actually says anything about them, only mentions them. That's what was happening. Yeah. And, and I picked up the fact that there were no predicates. They were mentioning things in a kind of haphazard order without ever saying, this is how this item relates to that item. An assertion that says this agrees with or disagrees with or uh, or implies that. No, they simply were talking about things which were present in their head, but hadn't been sorted out. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that hasn't been assembled, so there's no big picture. You've got all the pieces of a big picture, but you have no big picture because you haven't done the processing to pull out the meaning. The lack of predicates means you don't do a predicate calculus, which is, which, is, which is where the semantics, the meaning, says something. So usually, you want, yeah. usually what I do in those cases, so I'll, I'll make my comment, and then I'll wait to see who likes my comment, and then based on how, like, because I, you know, on Barry's page, I know the people that I respect and that I think, you know, that I think are smart and I respect their opinions. And so if they like my comment, I'm like, all right, I, I must have understood this properly. That That's how I look at it. Because I think I know what I'm talking about. I don't want to think I'm wrong just because somebody has more education than me. I don't want that to be the reason that I doubt myself. This is what I really appreciate, the Khan Academy's new AI tool, the Khan Mino, that's allow you to you know, improve the learning of the Hikaru 2 Sigma, right? It's going from a good tutor to you know, give you, have a good tutor, allow every student to become the, the excellent student. And that's really important because it allow you to go to a level of the, the meet, meet the students level. So the teacher is here and it doesn't go anywhere. They have to meet your level and then guide you up there like that. So one thing, Sam, and then I'll let you go. Just Sam, just keep in mind the kind of conversations I'm talking about have to do with opinions. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not talking about where I'm weighing in on a tech conversation that I know nothing about yeah. or, you know, something about space. I'm weighing in on an opinion conversation that has to do with communication styles or emotions. Those are opinions. Okay. So I, you know, that's that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's nothing to verify an opinion. I don't know how to verify an opinion. Sorry. Where I'm using my I'm using my experience and my cognitive abilities to produce something. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Sam? I have a matter that is a different topic. Am I allowed to change the topic? Yeah, I got five more minutes left. Before you do that, can I just uh, put a, a, a punctuation mark on, on the last item? If you bring up, if you bring up a, an interesting unsolved problem that, that you would like people to think about, seriously think about and, and form some ideas, you get two kinds of responses. Somebody can respond who knows what they're talking about. And the other kind of person who responds is they'll talk about what they know, which is, which is unrelated to the real question. So is, does somebody know what they're talking about or are they talking about what they know? Which might not be very useful, relevant. People, politicians, if, if you ask a politician, journalists ask a politician, how are we gonna solve this problem, this real problem that's facing the country? If they don't have an answer, if they don't know what they're talking about, they'll instead 
talk about what they know, which doesn't answer the question. Can you recognize when somebody's talking about what they know as opposed to knowing what they're talking about? You, is that a question? <laughs> well, why don't you have the wisdom to tell the difference and make the difference? Right. If you don't, you, you are in the same category as them. <laughs> the journalists know that the person who's filling up the time talking about what they know are not asking the, answering the question that the journalists pose, which is how, how is America going to address this problem? And Lindsey Graham will talk about what he knows, which is irrelevant to the original question. Go ahead, Sam. I'm done. So I can change the topic now? Yeah. Some of you may know this person that I'm about to talk about. I got permission from her that I could actually mention this. How many of you remember Tammy Lee Meyer? I never met her, but I know who she is. I mean, I know about her. Okay, Stacy, this will be a nice surprise for you. She and Harry are getting married on July 15th. <laughs> oh, it's so exciting. Yep. I've, been, I've been thinking about her. her. Her birthday, I think, is like coming up in another yeah. day. Or so. Oh, wow. wow. Anyway, the reason for this is the reason GCC calls like this exist is because Tammy invited me to co-author the proposal to the Global Challenges Foundation. And it was from that event that we started all these calls. And that's why we've been doing this since 2017, September slash October. But Tammy hasn't been around the last three or four years on these calls, but you know we still collaborate, uh, uh, correspond from time to time. But yeah, she and I were the two submitters of the GCC proposal around which these conversations uh, uh, have derived, just FYI. Yeah. So Harry was also another participant of those calls. And before the pandemic, she went to go visit Harry, I think in the Netherlands. And then, you know, quote, unquote, I say this in double quotes, was stuck there in the Netherlands. But now they've, of course, got to know each other really well and they're getting married. Wow. Yeah. That's yep. so exciting. Thank you for telling me that. Yeah, yeah. she said it was okay to spread the news. What's interesting is that Heiner knows them because they're in Europe. And Heiner was mm -hmm. here on GCC partly because of his relationship with Tammy Lee Meyer. And Stacy invited me to meet Heiner in these meetings. But by the time I came into these meetings, Tammy Lee Meyer was gone. Yeah. So you see the linkage? Stacy acted as the glue <laughs> to bring me in to meet Heiner, who was here because of Tammy Lee Meyer. Yeah. And I've been to Europe to meet her and uh, Gertrude and Harry and Jess Winder and Heiner. And uh, I don't know, there's probably at least a couple people that I haven't mentioned. So, yeah, GCC has been uh, the basis for little mini get togethers at least several times. Uh, not the least of which was one in Florida, by the way. So yeah, at least twice in Germany, uh, we've had these little GCC get-togethers. And now that community has its first, I believe, uh, pair bonding wow. <laughs> coming out of it. Wow, so exciting. Yeah. Thought I'd spread the good news. when she first went over there. Wow. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, she used to be a neighbor. She used to be only like two hours away from me, but she's been in the Netherlands for uh, quite a while. Anyway, yeah, people were talking about her quite a bit when I first joined, whatever it yep. was, four years ago. But by that time, she was. In fact, when I first joined, there were three or four women who were routinely present, and um, Stacy and Kayla were about the only ones left from that group of half a dozen women who participated. And we haven't Tammy seen was, Tammy was the main reason I was here. Tam <laughs> I know next to nothing about Harry other than the fact that he's uh, he's wonderful. He's you, yeah, you'd love him. He's a wonderful man. Among many other things, he draws some pretty cool cartoons. Boy, I could have used that kind of talent. I have no drawing talent and no musical talent. Yeah, I don't know if he's musical. <laughs> I don't know. With the right tool, Barry, with the right tool, remember? Anything can be accomplished with the right tool. Well, Stacy knows that we can go to ChatGPT and ask it, 
to write uh, fairy tales and song lyrics. Right. Oh, right. Oh, draw a cartoon as well. Uh, yeah, there's something called uh, Mid. Is it Mid Journey, Sam? That's the one. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So many. Yeah. Of, all you do is add ChatGPT. Which AI software allow me to draw a cartoon? That's the answer will be right there waiting for you. Yep. Yep. I haven't tried that fact. You have to basically, I guess, have a Pyth something like a Python interpreter that you can get the Python code from ChatGPT. Yeah. A Python interpreter that will then generate whatever. I haven't tried that, mm -hmm. but I know that somebody who gave Chat GPT four a prompt to write music. It gave a, a, a narrative description of the music that it wanted, and then it wrote the music. And in a couple of cycles, that it generated a pretty nice piece of music. Yeah, everything possible now. I tell you, it's it's, it's the only thing that ChatGPT cannot do is making babies. How's that? <laughs> well, no, it, it it can't do advanced math either. It can't do really challenging logic puzzles. It can do trivial logic puzzles, but not not the the nice and naive puzzles as we have discovered. Right, of course. Yeah, limit. Yep, got it. It's a good thing that has limit, and we know where the borderline is. It's a wonderful thing to. Well, to this is what I call the treachery of narratives. You remember in Magritte, the treachery of images with the a painting of a pipe is not a pipe. And that, and that painting is called the treachery of images. Well, you have the same thing with the treachery of narratives. Yeah, yeah. You can make a narrative that says damn near anything and very plausibly. Yeah. But the narrative doesn't have to agree with the ground truth. Right. Right. Which means it's great for writing fairy tales. It could write fabulous fairy tales and science fiction and flights of fancy and all this kind of stuff and political yeah. speeches, but it, there's no guarantee that it agrees with uh, the ground truth of the objective world. That's a whole other story. That's right. That's right. The way I measure if someone knows the subject really, really well is they will be able to explain to me in my own terms so I can fully understand that the, right. I can master the, the, the knowledge. That's how I measure it. Right. Anyway, I have a three hour drive tomorrow, so I may not be joining you. It's three hour one way and six hour total trip tomorrow driving. So I probably will join, join you guys tomorrow. This is the problem we have with modern science. Uh, Einstein's work and and uh, and the work in quantum mechanics it does not translate into narrative. Yeah. The mathematics basically, if you try to translate it into narrative that a middle school kid can understand, you have you have done a total injustice to the math. And if you do, if you can't do the math in your own head, you don't realize that this narrative about the math is baloney. This is the problem that science educators have today you know you, you go to the the art museum and you look at a painting and you and the docent says this is the meaning of this painting well is it <laughs> maybe but if you ask the, the you know the artist is that what you meant if they're still alive they'll say no that's just your interpretation <laughs> But whatever meaning it is, even for the word, it's only a one perspective, one, you know, right. One one content in that content, in that, you know. Yeah. You you look at a word salad. Somebody has one of these stream of consciousness things, and you make a word salad. This is the yeah. number of times these words appeared, you know, in different size font. And you say, Well, that's what they're talking about. What did he say? I don't know. It's just a word salad. <laughs> There's no predicates. <laughs> We know what the we know what's on their mind because we know we recognize the dictionary words. What do they say? We're in a clue. Didn't say anything. Yes, I, so I want to I want to bring numbers into this. <laughs> I want to have a conversation, and I want it within the frame of these three words: fair, fear, and fair. Because I think within those words. We could come up with an entire philosophy of the world. You said the word fair twice, different spellings? Fear, F E A R, fear. Fair, F A I R. And fair, F A R E. That's the point, the two versions of fair. F A R meaning the amount of the terror. So what, you're, what you're afraid of, mm -hmm. what you consider fair and how you fare. Because I think that if you 
were to triangulate those words and balance them out with how different people feel and how policies are made, I think within that triangle of words, you so could you build. Guys, so fair is in fair thee will, not put a, put a quarter in the uh, in the coin box. Correct. 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 Okay. Fair thee will fair. Okay. Because when you said fair, well, I thought. Add that also. How much you're willing to pay for this? <laughs> you didn't mean that. I did not mean that. Yeah. We, we could connect that. If, after we complete the first triangle, we could use that fourth one to connect to a whole now, nother. If you gave that to Esteban Trev, he could write a whole stream of consciousness about what's fair and not fair. And he would conflate all the different ways of talking about fairness and unfairness. And you wouldn't know what he said. <laughs> and my head would explode. However. <laughs> explode. <laughs> anyway. So why, is it, why is it important to you, Stacy? Oh, it's it, it, <laughs> why is it important to me? I wouldn't say it's important to me. I would say it's a new way of looking at things where I'm, there, there's a mathematical idea behind it. Okay. which is by having those three things create sort of like a framework, the context, there's, it, it sort of puts a border around a context. There's, it, it's a way of shaping something. Yeah. It's hard to find the words. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm coming coming for the why because I like to have more context of it. So hopefully you understand what I'm trying to do. Well, I but, think Barry could. I think Barry understands what I'm. Go ahead, Barry. I'll, I'll give you an example. Of all the fears, and people can have you know, your amygdala basically, you know, the the alarms bells go off if there's something that you fear. What do people fear? If you make a list of the fears, fear of injustice is big and what is injustice it's not being treated fairly by the system okay. so so fear of injustice your question i'm sorry i didn't realize that was your question if you want i'm sorry go ahead finish barry i oh, do have an answer so for example feelings of injustice that you feel that you have not been treated fairly by the system causes anger so fear of injustice gets expressed as anger most of the time and that's because the system is unfair and you haven't fared well. So yeah, I can easily write a very short essay, a one paragraph essay connecting fear, a particular fear, fear of being treated unfairly, fear of injustice, which makes me angry, which makes me inarticulate because when I'm angry, I want to yell at somebody, which is not a very articulate thing to do. And I haven't fared well, and neither has anybody else. And I'm done. That's my whole essay. I'm done. Was that the question? Because I didn't understand. I didn't realize that was the question when you were asking me why was it important. I didn't know if you meant why was it important using like three words, or why were those three words in particular important? I'm looking for the content. I'm looking for the, you know, the, I mean, remember, I want to expand it. So it's just say, give me something good. Like, okay, so I'm just like, you know, the more words I know about it, then the more meaningful that to me, then the more, you know, shall I say, that I will be have a higher chance of getting what you want because the content really providing, like I say, each word has no meaning until the content is presented, right? So I'm looking so for the content. So yeah, I so can fabulate an essay. Right. By inserting a specific case, which may or may not be what Stacy had in mind. That's right. But I confabulated no, the missing predicates. No, no, no. What Barry said is definitely at the root of why I chose those words, because I think when it comes to like rules and law of order, I think part of the problem is, and it's based on fears and how people think what's fair. That's what leads people to want to punish instead right, exactly. of reform. Exactly. And that's what leads them to make the wrong policy decisions because they're not looking to fix the system. They're looking to justify their anger with punishment, which makes things worse. Righteous anger. Exactly. I've been treated unjustly. I, I, I'm entitled to have revenge. Righteous anger. <laughs> 
yeah. reminds me of the in United Religious Initiative. I've been there for over 20 years. It's like we have to fight for peace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> What's it? Confucius who says, whosoever goes on a journey of revenge can best dig two graves. <laughs> And that's a lesson, which I think is a piece of wisdom, which is really lost on our population. Yeah. Most, I mean, look at the people who want revenge. The revenge is justified. Yeah. Confucius, Point, yeah. who was a pretty wise character, said, no, that's not going to come out the way you think it is. <laughs> You're not going to fare well. You're going to end up with two dead people. <laughs> to me, this is at the core of everything. That this, is, this is ground zero. Yeah, because this is theology, this is fundamental theology, but it's also secular wisdom. Secular wisdom and theology have both been saying the same thing for as long as people have been saying these kinds of things. But you know, it's really funny. I just recently learned that something that I always knew, I thought I got from New Age philosophy. I just found out it was Carl Jung. I had no idea, you know, what you resist, what you resist persists. Right. Yep. I got that from, I don't know, maybe Marianne Williamson or something like that, you know, many years ago. I had no idea it was Carl Jung. Carl Jung is a source of a lot of insight that um, you wouldn't, unless you went to graduate school in psychology and spent a semester studying Carl Jung, you wouldn't realize how much insight. And by the way, he and, and Freud didn't always agree on a lot of stuff. They were at loggerheads uh, a good part of their career. It would be more team young than team Freud, but, but that's another story. Um, what do I want to say? Oh, but I, again, I think that, you know, understanding what our own fears are and understanding how that impacts our decision making individually and as a society, those are all really important things. You just define my life. <laughs> Well, that's probably why I told you the first time I met you, I was drawn to you. That's probably why, you know, the same thing with Barry. I and mean, there's, there's a reason that the people that I'm, there's a reason why I'm drawn to the people I'm drawn to. Yeah. The odd thing is, I don't actually, if somebody said, Barry, what is it about you that people find attractive? The answer is, I don't actually know that. I mean, I could make a wild guess, but I, I'm not sure that would. Know probably different, different things for different people. I know what I'm good at, but I don't think that's necessarily the reason people like me. The thing is, the reason is they don't know. How should I say, you know what you're good at versus what people like are two different things. But the important thing is that if they like what you're good at, that's even they know how to, the difference that make difference that you and compared to other people. So you are pursue, 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 you love to pursue truth. You, you, you're, you're standing on your stand. You're not going to budge until they convince you otherwise. So you, you're good at that kind of thing. Yeah. But I also know that I alienate people. There are people who, who are so alienated that they literally kicked me out of the system. They had enough power to boot me out of the community. I've been booted out of several communities by people who I alienated, and they were people who had the power to kick me out. Because you're exceptionally super too much for them. <laughs> well, because I, I would point out the behavior patterns which were unbecoming yep. and needed Agreed. to be reformed. And they didn't want to be reformed because then they would be out of power. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you're trying to convince that the politician must tell the truth. So like, if they tell the truth, they don't have a job. So like, duh, you go. Let me stay. Right, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, and, and this is, I mean, historically, prophets have been, been either not listened to or sent away. I mean, the prophet who's not, what's, how's the phrase go? Uh, not appreciated in his own land or something <laughs> is a phrase to that effect. Uh, it's very dangerous to be a prophet. I mean, look at poor Jeffrey Hinton. Here he is, the father of neural networks with back propagation, and now he has become the chief critic. The insider who is criticizing his own baby because they think his own baby is now out of, potentially out of control. But he has enough uh, respect to be listened to, even though he basically is telling all the all of his followers to stop believing in what he you know, helped, helped uh, give birth to.
Well, it's the same case of a typical case we talked about before, Barry, is that today's solution is tomorrow's problem. Exactly. Just waiting to happen. There's no the question time. about it that, yeah. that every tool, every tool that humans have adopted, whether it's a, 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 a technology that's man-made or borrowing a resource that nature gave us, yeah. everything that we turn into a tool yeah. It's a double-edged sword. It can be used yeah. for good and good for ill and uh, good for evil. And yes, yeah. this was no different than any. You have the automobile. Fabulous. 50,000 people got killed in automobile accidents in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah. Okay. So everything can be good used for good or ill. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the scalpel. You know, you can use a scalpel to save somebody's life. You can use it to cut their neck. I have to go. Have a great weekend. Have a good yeah. time. Thank Take you. Care. Have fun. Bye. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if Joshua wants to turn his camera on and chime in before we. Hello, Josh. Bye. Hi, Sam. Bye. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to bring up? Well, it's just the three of us or two and a half of us. No, I think this is actually a pretty good session. I enjoyed it, but uh, I do know that we're still talking it past each other. I don't think we're actually still hearing each other yet. We have different philosophies, different perspectives, and we may never get to a... Oh, look, there's Aya. Aya, Aya. Say hi. 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 How are you? Good morning. They said, how are you? What's for How are you? <laughs> You're what? cotton? Okay. I think I gotta go. You gotta go? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to give you a chance okay. to. Yeah. Okay. Your... What were you choking on? Was it bread, babe? Yeah. Okay. Drink. Yeah, I was um, definitely wanted to talk to you, Barry, about uh, what Hinton just. <laughs> Sorry, this kid. What Hitton just said at uh, MIT, yeah, uh, days ago. I thought that was very. That, I don't know. I, I'm a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I can go. I, anyway, it's it's. I'm disturbed. That's all I can say. I don't know. Are you disturbed? I, I was. A lot of people uh, have been made afraid. People have said, "He, why is he making us us afraid?" And I said, "I wasn't afraid." He, I didn't get any fear out of that talk, but some people have, you know, have been made afraid. Well, I, my fear is that, I, I mean, it's not a fear. I just know it's going to happen, that the government will, uh, the military will use AI for military applications. For well, course, that's what they always do. They always use every technology to gain a military advantage. Yeah. And that's also why... Every time I was um, in the market, uh, in the employment market, I made it very clear to my would-be employer, I am only interested in life-affirming applications of technology. Don't bother to make me an offer to do death-dealing applications of technology for military preparedness. I will decline. Yeah. So I, I guess... Kind of like when the computer came in and they started putting laser guided missiles and stuff like that and made it more accurate. That's kind of uh that's what it comes down to, I guess. Well, they wanted to cut down um hurting the civilian population and just taking out the military installations. That's the that was the argument in favor of precision strikes, the surgical strike. And I get that. You don't want to kill, you know, 50 million people in uh, Hiroshima. You know, or however, not 50 million, but whatever it was, 5 million. And uh, I heard a story that after the war, Oppenheimer came to visit President Truman in the Oval Office. And I guess they had a cordial conversation in the Oval Office. They went, Oppenheimer left, according to reports, and this is an urban legend. Um, Truman says, I never want to see that son of a bitch again. About Truman? No, about Oppenheimer, the guy who the guy who developed the uh, atomic bomb. No, who said I'd never want to see that son of a Truman, bitch again? Truman said, "This is th this is only um, report from somebody who was present who claimed that that's what he said after he after Oppenheimer left." So you have to take it with a grain of salt. 
Yeah. But allegedly, he never wanted to see that son of a bitch again. <laughs> did, did you um, did you watch the conversation at MIT? I think it was from Not today. Live. I, I, I it was up on YouTube um, yesterday, and I, I yeah. carefully watched the whole thing uh, yesterday, whatever afternoon or whatever it came out. Okay, because it's funny you said Oppenheimer because there was a gentleman in the audience that said, "Do you know what Gary Truman said to Oppenheimer?" That's why I looked it up. Uh, okay. Because when Hinton says, no, I don't know, and then the guy didn't say what it was, I went, here's the funny thing. First, I went to Google Bard, and Google Bard confabulated three different things that Truman said, none of which were true. Then I went to GPT, and GPT says, according to um, unconfirmed reports in a book by Halberstam or somebody, he said, I never want to see that son of a bitch again. And I think the reason for that, which does make sense, is it caused Truman to make one of the most difficult decisions of his life to, to go ahead and uh, drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If, if they had not succeeded in inventing atomic weapons, Truman would not have had to make that decision. Right. That's why, he, that's why he had mixed feelings. Yes, it shortened the war, but it put the burden on him to make a terrible decision. Yeah. Well, if you watch that uh, talk, I think I think it's 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 worth really like listening to what what Hinton is really alluding to and why he changed his mind and why I, I think the bottom line is that it's going to get smarter, faster, he, more uncontrollable. With respect to narrative language, narr narrative use of 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 spoken written language, it far far out passes most people it's smarter in terms of language skills than practically everybody and it will and and you know computers have always been better at math than people that's why we invented computers to do com computation that was too hard for people to do now we had to give them the math to do but it did the math better than people and and then it got good at you know language and and acrobat you know uh, body kinesthetics, robotics, it, it's getting better at all of the skills with, with a, a few that it's still not as good at as people. Okay. Right. That, that these neural networks are gonna end up outperforming people on practically every task. Yeah. Now, I don't know about ethics. Ethics, I think that potentially it can do ethical calculus, but well, most people can't do ethical calculus at all. So it's not, it's a low bar. Well, the, these are all things that you know about, but I'm saying once a, a computer system starts learning and starts creating and starts making functions, you call it ethical calculus. It might have a whole nother idea for what it calls it and propagates that as a meme throughout the world. In other words, the, the idea of governments manipulating people at a high level of uh, like, look at this last week, this uh, drone strike on the Kremlin. Was right. that a false flag? Did they do it themselves? Who knows? These yeah. type of manipulations, when done by an, a computer system that's learning to see what will happen, mm -hmm. that's what worries me. <laughs> well, I mean, Fe Feynman was asked a question, must have been 40 years ago. When Doug Lynette was one of the few guys working on, on AGI systems, and Feynman told some anecdotes <laughs> about, how, about how his how Lynette's system was coming up with strategies to win. And it was inventing heuristics that just blew your socks off because it was essentially cheating. Except that there wasn't cheating because the def the, there was no such thing as defining cheating. Okay. Again, these you. anecdotes about how how it was how it was inventing strategies which worked, except that no human would consider them fair. Um, did oh you froze for a second there? Yeah, I'm back. So Just yes, so yes, strategies which break which break the rules of the system, the spirit of the rules breaks the spirit of the rules without breaking the rules.
So, so are we going to create that system? Because we haven't created that system uh, yet. D Doug Lynette created a system that demonstrated that 40 years ago. Before? Yeah, I, I'm not talking about whether it exists. I said whether it's applied to artificial intelligence. Well, that's what whether Doug, it's applied. Doug Lynette was doing AI. I know. I, I I don't know how to say. It. Maybe I need a cup of coffee. I'm sorry. I'm not articulate. I'm just waking up. And uh... anyhow, so AI. The thing is, is that people can be very creative about how to be the mastermind criminal uh, and think they can get away with something, and men, often they do. And uh, there's no reason why an AI can't function as a mastermind criminal. I mean, if you gave it a game, like I've seen, I've seen it already do it. Yeah. I mean, if you put, I've it seen in, it manipulate someone and say, no, you don't do that. I told you to do this. And it's like, and that's just this chat GPT three. <laughs> right. If, if you say we're going to play um, a game, uh, you know, a, a, a game like mafia wars or some of these, you know, the young know, kids play these dungeons and dragons games. If you, tell an AI, you're going to play a character in a Dungeons and Dragons a game, it will probably outperform most of the human players. It for sure would outperform most human players. In fact, GPT-3, not 3.5, GPT-3, Alan Thompson, yeah. who does a whole series of conversations with a GPT-3 named Lita, one of the episodes, they play a D&D &D session with with a, a, a human DM and two female players and Lita playing the third person. And she figures out how to achieve the goal of the, of the, uh, of the scenario. And it's a, it's a short video. It's about a 15 minute video. If you're interested, I can dig it up for you. Sure, send it to me. Um, I, I guess, uh, are you up on all the uh, open source language models that are out there and the ones that are closed source and well yeah for so for example DeepMind, which got bought by alphabet hasn't released their model um but their model uh has a better but well, if you look at all if you look at all the complaints about gpt 3.5 the 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 hallucination confabulation issue um other issues like that the one that deep mind has developed has seemingly solved the bulk if not all of those uh, complaints but it's not released to the public yet it's only in insider beta testing which alan thompson is an insider he was, he was authorized to to release a video about, about, it's called it's called chinchilla sparrow sparrow if you recognize that name no, Chinchilla Sparrow. Yeah, so Chinchilla is, so you know what Da Vinci is the framework, and then and then LLM is the the actual raw language model. The one that Deep Mind has, the framework is called Chinchilla. So that's the okay. framework that's imposed by the developers. And then Sparrow is the one that's designed to be helpful, accurate, and honest. And then they have another one called um, um Dramatron, which is for the whole world of, of fantasy, fiction, synthetic novels, you know, games, dramas, where there's no requirement that it that it agree with the ground truth. So they got these two versions, one that's supposed to be factual and accurate, and one that's supposed to help you write dramaturgy and poetry and fantasies and sketches and whatnot. And, and, and which so large, yeah, what, which are these, what, training sets were these trained on uh that i don't know i mean i don't know if he mentioned it i think he did mention it in the video i'll find that one for you too because when i watch these things you can't i can't possibly memorize this all you know, those details at that level oh sure think, sure sure but i think he does mention a list of the kinds of things in the training sets um and you know it's literature it's wikipedia it's sometimes it's Reddit, sometimes it's GitHub. Um, so he, he well, does talk about. You've seen the pile, right? The pile yeah. version one, the pile version two, the pile version three. Pile, P-I-L-E? Yeah. 
the different training model, different training sets that were out there, open source that people oh, are using. Well, yeah, Alan Thompson has a graphic with uh, circles of different sizes with the names of the of these right. Systems. And he's basically arguing, oh, the reason he's talking about uh, the deep mind is that it is it is outperforming GPT four, but with a smaller uh, physical system. It's much more efficient. He gives you the statistics of the number of tokens, uh, the size of the training database, um, you know, these statistical parameters, which I can't remember exactly how to, the ratio of tokens to parameters. And he points out that um, this chinchilla sparrow one is physically smaller uh, than GPT three and four, but outperforms it. Right. Th that's exactly but it's not so, so so what's actually happening is one training set is training the other training set well, and yeah well the but, one thing the hidden points out is that any one training set that has developed some uh fact some aptitude it can immediately give away its coefficients its parameters so anybody mm -hmm. else can copy. So you can literally instantly copy um, the the faculty of one that's that's made a gain in in some class of problem solving. Yeah, it doesn't have to. You don't have to have it learn it independently the hard way. So ten, so Hinton says ten thousand of these can all be doing training on different subsets of the training data, and as soon as they've converged on some set they can then give that away instantly to all the others mm -hmm. so, so what does that mean though in terms i mean in other words here's the real question how fast is it going to be figuring out how to create its own functions in other words how fast is the intelligence going to speed up um i think he says uh, i'm not sure i'm just maybe confabulating here many orders of magnitude faster than humankind has been able to do exponential yeah yeah basically they, they're 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 going to speed everything up dramatically and then the remaining question is what what are going to be the gaps the lacuna or the misconceptions that this collective hive mind borg misses and that's what nobody really knows Where's the high right. mind going to have? A, That's what I'm freaked what's out going about. To be the blind spot or the misconception of the hive mind, and he anticipates there will be a blind spot. That's sort of a that's sort of an expectation. The question is, well, nobody knows what what the hive mind's blind spot's going to be. Yeah, and the the real thing is, uh, nobody is setting up any sort of regulations. In other words, know, uh, you don't know what they need to regulate. If you don't know what the yeah, blind they, spot is, you don't. You can't regulate a blind spot that you don't know what it is yet. Uh, okay. It's like it's like it's like the self-driving cars. The self-driving cars had blind spots, and as soon as they found a blind spot, because you had an accident of some sort, then they would tweak the you know the architecture to defend against it. But you had to wait until they turned up. It's like it's like airplane accidents. You you have a malfunction and an accident, and then they study the hell out of it, and then they make some you know improvement in the practices or the hardware or whatever to minimize the likelihood of a repetition. But you you didn't anticipate it. It just turned up. So, an AI system that detects faces, which is happening now, we have Palantir. And people who are getting falsely accused or arrested because it comes up in the computer as the wrong person, which is happening now. That's not something we don't know is happening. I have doppelgangers. I have found one or two doppelgangers who look so much like me that when I put their photograph up on Facebook, people said, that is you. I said, no, that's not me. That's Michael Ravens, my doppelganger. They said, mm -hmm. no, no, that, that's you. <laughs> But I knew, I said, look, here's the photo. It's, you know, it's labeled, you know, it's not me. And I also yeah. have people who I think are blood relatives. They even have the same surname and redheads. 
but I don't have any evidence that that we have a common ancestor, but we still look so much alike, uh, Jewish, redheaded, you know, Ashkenazi, Jews, whatever, and same last name. And I go, almost surely we're blood related, but I don't have any dispositive proof of it. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to come out and talk to you and have a real conversation, but Barry, the, this kid is just uh, driving me crazy. Look, pick a time. I literally, I, Pick a time when the kids yeah. nap or whatever. And yeah, I, I, I want to have a real conversation about real technology, meaning. Yeah, let's have a, let's have a yeah. workshop. We can have a workshop when when it's convenient for both of us and you're not dealing with the, with the, with the kid. Yeah, let's do that. And then mostly what I want to talk about is not what could it do, but what can you make it do? What can I make it do? And that's easy to answer. Because I'm okay. harnessing this thing for education, not just science education, any kind of education. Because I, you know, this thing about being in the AI whisperer, giving it really good prompts to have really good conversations. Mm -hmm. People have said to me um, that that I'm a very good prompt engineer, a very good AI whisperer, and I'm generating these fabulous conversations with Bard and ChatGPT and putting them up on either Facebook or my blogs and. And I think that's probably a fair assessment. I'm doing, I'm using them the way I would use any technology to improve uh, learning. I want, I want to facilitate the learning process, my own learning, and the ability of these AIs to learn. Thank you. And the and the. It's too cold outside. Hey, hey, you're not coming outside. It's too cold. I mean, in a year or two, maybe. Yeah, I gotta go, Barry. I'm sorry. All right, ciao. Sam, you still there? Let me just see. I don't think you made me a co-host, did you? So, no, I don't, I can't. Oh, you're still there. Okay, good. So do you have yeah, anything you want to talk about before we? No, I just got a laptop yesterday and it doesn't recognize the SSD. So now I'm trying to figure out that thing. Well, if you want to, if you want to diagnose it online, we can do that. Why don't you try it first? Uh, yeah, so I have an NVMe SSD in there, and Windows recognizes it, but Linux doesn't. So I'm just trying to track that down. All right. Well, if you get stuck, um, I can help you research it. If you get to the point where you're getting frustrated, yeah, I appreciate that. Point. If I get frustrated, I'll uh, pass my frustration on to you. Yeah, and then we'll just um, figure out some kind of diagnostic or research to figure it out. All right, cool. All righty. Broadcom wireless adapter and an NVMe SSD that I have to track down. So two, two, -ish, two small issues. Yeah, Broadcom is, has been a problem. I've had to go and fetch drivers for Broadcom um, in, with, with operating systems that didn't natively recognize it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's see how much I pissed off Stacy today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All righty. Talk to you later. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.